is later on in the day. The rain will put turn quite persistent across western areas of Scotland as well. And here there's a rain warning in force, but it does introduce much milder air, so it will be a warmer day. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel... Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Tuesday, the 9th of April. Lock them up. Alan Bates, the superstar sub postmaster, has come out swinging at the post office inquiry. Mr Bates says bonuses should be clawed back and prosecutions should be made. Council fat cats. It's revealed that a record number of town hall staff are pocketing more than 150 grand a year. This despite households being slapped with soaring council tax bills. I like that picture. <laughs> and as Labour announces plans to crack down on tax evasion, the public thinks the party has questions to answer on tax avoidance. New polling finds two-thirds of voters think Angela Rayner should publish her tax advice. Now, we're going to go live to Downing Street to show pictures of the anticipated arrival of the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. He will be visiting Number 10 this hour, shaking hands with the Prime Minister and no doubt discussing the particulars of the Rwandan plan. A plane is still yet to get off the ground. Yes, it's currently 12.01. He is due to arrive at 12, so he is 
as yet, fashionably late. Just as late as the Rwanda legislation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to be fair, we've kept him waiting <laughs> in some respects. So, uh, yes, perhaps he'll arrive soon. I'm sure he will arrive reasonably mm. on time. But, of course, this is a big moment for Paul Kagame. He's been uh, a, a figure on the international stage for some time. But, of course, two days ago was the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. And Rwanda is a country that has moved on so far since that genocide. A genocide, actually, that Paul G Kagame helped to end. Yes. Because he was part of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. So he's been very busy indeed. He was leading commemorations for this 30-year anniversary of that uh, genocide. And he's clearly flown all the way to the United Kingdom to meet our Prime Minister. So Rishi Sunak will presumably be inside getting ready, getting prepped for his meeting. Lots to talk about with regard to the Rwanda deportation and plan, of course. And might this Ooh. be him arriving now? The ro red carpet has, of course, been rolled out. But let's just have a look. There is a car arriving on Downing Street now. Uh, f uh, it is, of course, a government official car with flashing lights there. The Range Rovers, multiple Range Rovers there. And we're about to see, it looks like, Paul Kagame step out. There he is, the president of Rwanda since 2000, walking down Downing Street, that famous street, ready to meet with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of yes. the United Have Kingdom. Yes. Have you off the migrant housing, Mr President? Prime Minister, if you don't get flights to Rwanda, are you finished? Uh, we can hear shaking hands outside number 10. You could hear a journalist there calling out questions to Rishi Sunak the and the president. The traditional shouts. The traditional shouts, of course. Uh, and there they go in. And lots, lots of, of flashing pictures from the official number 10 photographer just inside the door. We got a sneak peek there inside number 10, where uh, no doubt this is a big, big meeting for Rishi Sunak as well as for Paul Kagame. And you can tell that the official government photographer there inside the building taking pictures. No doubt we'll start to see those pictures uh, go out on, on number 10 official uh, streams And lots as well. of other officials going in behind them, of course. And um, the questions that were being shouted at the pair there refer perhaps to the t report in The Times today that some of the housing that was due to be allocated to migrants has in fact been bought up by Rwandan citizens. Mm. Um, but we'll dig into the detail on that with Catherine Forster a little bit later. Um, but let's get your headlines with Sophia. Good afternoon, it's 12 o'clock. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story this hour. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kulsama Akta died after being stabbed on Westgate in Bradford. Police launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, murder squad detectives are investigating after a woman was found stabbed to death in central London. The victim was discovered dead, having suffered multiple stab wounds in her home near Hyde Park. The Metropolitan Police say they are working 24-7 to identify and arrest whoever may be responsible for the attack. Lead campaigner and former sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Horizon IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led the post office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in the Horizon software system. Mr Bates is giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office and Fujitsu, which built the computer software at the heart of the scandal. When Horizon came in, I think I was quite positive about it um, because I, I knew what technology and these sorts of systems could do, so um, I, I was quite positive. But I, I found it a bit frustrating once the system was installed and we were operating. I, I found there were many shortcomings in the system, and um, knowing what these systems could do, it just seemed a bit of a lost opportunity. 
In other news, six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as people smugglers clashed with asylum seekers, trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two of the migrants being stabbed multiple times. The incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from a large group of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. Labour is set to announce a new crackdown on tax avoiders today in a bid to help fund the NHS. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will pledge to raise over £5 billion per year, which Labour would use to tackle NHS waiting lists and fund free school breakfast clubs. The party has said it will also raise £2.6 billion over the next parliament by closing loopholes in the government's plans to abolish exemptions for non-DOMs. Shadow Financial Secretary James Murray says it's wrong that people are getting away without paying what they owe. We're setting up our plans today to crack down on that tax avoidance and to get that money um, into the public purse because, you know, when people right across Britain are paying more and more tax, uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. We've been setting out for a number of years about ending a non-DOM tax status. The government said they wanted to follow our lead after years of saying they wouldn't, uh, but they're leaving open loopholes in that, which means that people can avoid paying hundreds of millions of pounds of tax. So we want to close those loopholes, but that's part of a broader approach approach to investment in HMRC. The Foreign Secretary has met Donald Trump in Florida as he looks to shore up support for Ukraine. Lord Cameron's meeting with Mr Trump follows reports claiming the former US president said he could end the Russia-Ukraine war within 24 hours if re-elected. The two men discussed the war in Ukraine, NATO and the Middle East. It is the first summit between a senior government minister and the former president since he left office in 2021. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary will hold talks with the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, in Washington, D.C. And emergency services are dealing with a severe flooding incident in West Sussex and are telling people to get to high ground if they're able to. Southeast Ambulance Service helped evacuate and rescue a number of people from a holiday park. One person was taken to hospital with signs of hypothermia. West Sussex Fire and Rescue Service are operating in Littlehampton after the River Arran burst its banks in the wake of Storm Kathleen. The floods are also affecting roads and rail services across the south and into Wales. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now it's back to Tom and Emily. Good afternoon, Britain. Now we'll be back live in Downing Street in just a moment as, of course, the president of Rwanda has just arrived walking down the red carpet rolled out for him by Rishi Sunak. It's interesting, actually, already you've been getting involved on gbnews.com forward slash your say, the new place for your comments and views throughout the programme. Already Neil has said Kagame is here to ask for money. And Sunak will probably agree. So a little bit of scepticism there uh, about that meeting and that red carpet in Downing Street. Yes, and Gemma hopes they get down to business right away and don't waste too much time posing for the cameras. But we'll bring you the latest um, from that meeting. But before that, Alan Bates. We all know Alan Bates. He's led the campaign for justice in the post office scandal. He had his story turned into an ITV drama while he's giving evidence to the post office inquiry today right now. Yes, he suggested that those responsible for the post office scandal should be prosecuted. Speaking to another broadcaster, he said people have got to be held accountable. Yes, he's been very clear on that indeed. Well, we're joined by our correspondent, Theo Jacomba. Uh, Theo, this is a big moment in this inquiry. What has Alan Bates said so far? Yes, well, it's been described as the most widespread miscarriage of justice. And Alan Bates today is giving evidence here at Aldwych House in central London. And now, in previous uh, parts of um, this inquiry, we've heard from sub postmasters and sub postmistresses from across the country. Over 900 of them were affected by this Horizon IT system, uh, which led to some of them um, going into prison and some of them uh, taking their lives. Now, today, um, Alan Bates has been giving evidence 
evidence here in central London and he's been giving his experience and talking about how he noticed there were issues in the system, reported them, but they weren't taken seriously. This is some of what he's had to say so far. And initially it was because post office terminated my contract, given me three months notice and not giving me a reason for doing so. Um, purely because, in my belief, is that it was, I kept raising problems and concerns over its horizon system due to a number of faults I'd found over the years. You tell us in your statement that you spent um, that period of time seeking justice, accountability and redress for not just yourself and your uh, wife, but also on behalf um, of a much wider group of people, is that right? Yes, I did. Um, we, um, once I'd started my individual little campaign in there, <coughs> we, we found others along the way, and eventually we all joined up, and so the JFSA was born, and onwards went the campaign. <laughs> Now Alan Bates is the first to give evidence in this phase five of this inquiry and you'll be here uh, throughout the day uh, explaining uh, what happened during uh, his time when he worked uh, at his shop in Wales. Now he uh, will be focusing, this particular part of the phase will be focusing on the issues of governance, uh, redress and whistleblowing. Now of course um, it has got into some technical details uh, but of course what's been at the heart of all of this is the stories of sub-postmasters like him um, who found themselves uh, with shortfalls in their uh, post offices, wanted to address them, um, but they weren't able to at the time. Uh, some went to prison and have gone on to attempt to seek justice. So far, we do know 95 wrongful uh, convictions have been overturned and there were calls for government intervention, which has been put in place uh, to help some of those sub-postmasters and postmistresses. Thank you very much indeed, Theo Jacomba, who is outside the inquiry into the post office and the Horizon scandal. I guess lots of questions that people want answered. I mean, Alan Bates has made it very clear that he wants to see criminal prosecutions mm. for whoever's held responsible for what happened. Yes, criminal prosecutions and uh, the giving back of bonuses, the clawing back of bonuses from those bosses who looked the other way. Much more on that to come, no doubt, throughout the afternoon. Uh, but now, two-thirds of voters think that Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner should publicly reveal the tax advice on the sale of her former council house. That's according to a new poll. Yes, this is very interesting indeed, because lots of people have been very keen to downplay mm. the importance of this story. But Labour might not be cracking down on Rayner's tax problems, but they certainly are on Britain's, they're saying, with Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves unveiling the party's new plan plans to get tough on what they call tax dodgers. But is this terrible timing for the Labour Party given the Rayner tax scandal? Well, we're joined now by Luke Trill, the UK director of More In Common, the company behind this new polling. And, and Luke, just first of all, what did your poll actually reveal? So we asked uh, in this poll uh, whether the public thought that given um, the coverage of uh, Angela Rayner's um, house sale uh, and the suggestion that the right amount of tax wasn't paid, whether she should publish uh, the advice that she was given, that tax advice. And what we found was that two thirds of voters said that she should publish that uh, advice. It was less than one in five that felt that she shouldn't. Uh, and I think the reason that this is particularly important, uh, and I think it's particularly important for Angela Rayner, because one of the things I should say is that Angela Rayner is a very popular politician with the public. In fact, when we do focus groups, people often say she's the only politician that speaks for ordinary people. She's authentic. She's relatable. And I think the challenge is, by being seen to be evasive on this issue, she's, she's undermining that reputation uh, with the public. And I think that's why this matters.
Luke, do you think some people will be surprised by what you found with this polling, that about two thirds of the public want her to reveal her tax advice? Because there were lots of people, and of course, including the Labour Party, who want to sweep this story under the carpet. Lots of people saying, oh, she doesn't need to reveal her tax advice. She said she hasn't done anything wrong. That's enough. But it does seem like the public care about this story more than some might have hoped. Well, it's worth saying, I mean, it's quite a complex uh, story in terms of trickling through to the public. And, you know, the public are, are often likely in poll questions to say they want transparency from politicians. But I, I do think this goes to showing that actually, you know, when faced with that question, the public say, actually, we, we would like to see this advice and be able to come to uh, our own judgment on what happened. And I think this particularly matters for a Labour as they go into the election, because we know the public are very cynical. Trust in politicians is very low. Um, there have been a series of, you know, what you might call scandals, which have eroded that trust. And I think Labour will be determined to show, look, we're turning over a new leaf. We're going to be more transparent than what's come before. For. And I think by not being forward uh, with this advice, they're risking damaging that. So whilst I don't think, you know, this scandal is sort of, you know, fatal to Angela Rayner's career uh, in any way, I think it's the broader impact that it's likely to have on her brand, um, which okay. matters, which, as I say, is one of authenticity mm. uh, and speaking and saying it like it is. It's interesting, a lot of the time people refer to the Labour Party as a, a new iteration of, of Tony Blair's Labour Party of 1997. And, and with that leadership of the Labour Party back then in the 90s, you had the balancing act of, of Tony Blair and John Prescott. Blair was the, the slick former lawyer and Prescott, of course, the more authentic working class voice. That balancing act really worked for new Labour in the late 1990s. Is there a risk now that that same sort of leader, deputy leader situation could be undermined by this scandal? I, I think there is a risk. And I think the reason there's a risk is because it is abundantly clear that Angela Rayner can speak to a whole group of voters that Keir Starmer can't speak to. Actually, when you present them to voters uh, in a focus group as a package, they're actually much more positive about either of them uh, individually. And she does give Keir Starmer something else. We we know that you know, people say about Keir Starmer, oh, you know, he's a bit loyally. I'm not sure how in touch he is. Uh, he's not perhaps that exciting. And actually, Angela Rayner brings something else, which is why, as I say, I think it would be you know, a shame um, if uh, this scandal and the sense that she's been evasive undermined mm -hmm. that reputation. And as you say, posed a risk to that kind of that, that contrasting team, which seems to work quite well. And Luke, what about Keir Starmer's position on all of this? How's that going down? He's saying, essentially, my team have seen the advice. I have not myself seen the advice. What's all that about? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure uh, what it's about from his uh, perspective. But, uh, but again, I would say, you know, we've seen, if we look at some of the issues which have affected Rishi Sunak, it has undoubtedly damaged him personally when he's been seen to be too slow to act or not on top of what, you know, his ministers have been doing. And I think Keir Starmer might find himself in a similar position if he's not seen to be gripping this situation. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, getting rid of Angela Rayner, like, we, we don't know uh, the facts. And she's given very fulsome reassurances that she followed the advice and didn't do anything wrong. But I think that's why publishing this advice for both Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer could just be the easiest thing to do. Yeah, really, really interesting that Keir Starmer's saying continually that he doesn't need to see it, that he won't see it. Could he be insulating himself from anything down the tracks? Well, that is a question. But uh, Luke Trill, for now, thank you very much for joining us and talking through your polling. Really appreciate it. Uh, UK Director of More in Common. Of it does also raise the question of how much... I know there are accusations against Angela Rayner, so that makes it a little bit different. But you often hear people saying there should be complete transparency. If you're a member of Parliament, you should reveal everything everything about your tax affairs. Mm. And that's an interesting question, because I, to some extent, think, no, you shouldn't. Mm. It's already tough being in the public, you know, in the public space as it is to be an MP and accountable mm. to your constituents. Should you have to reveal everything? 
Yeah, it's an interesting one because a couple of people in the uh, in the GB uh, your say GBnews.com well, forward slash your say our new comment system. Uh, Warren has said it's not about the amount she owes. It's not about the tax. It's about the hypocrisy mm. because Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer last year uh, were saying that Rishi Sunak. Nadim Zahawi, because he was in a tax scandal at the time, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, they were saying all of those leading figures in the Conservative Party should publish their tax returns. Yeah. But then now Angela Rayner is saying she doesn't want to publish her own tax advice. I, I mean, it Even can't be one rule for the government and a different rule for the opposition. Well, David Lammy essentially said that there should be. They're not in government, so therefore less scrutiny is required, which is an interesting argument which when is... you're looking to become the next uh, government. Brendan says being evasive just means there is something to hide. That's how it can sometimes appear. We don't know if Angela Rayner has done anything wrong, whether she was given wrong tax advice. We simply don't know. And Keir Starmer, at the moment, is taking an interesting position. My team have seen the advice. I don't need to see the advice. I trust her. Is that enough for you? Clearly, it's not enough for the public. Mm. Lots of people will be thinking, is Keir Starmer simply getting ready to throw his own team and Angela Rayner as well under the bus simply for self-preservation? But so does he a... need her? Does he need her to appeal to the masses? Mm. Well, much more to come. Rishi Sunak has, of course, welcomed Rwandan President Paul Kagame to number 10. We saw that at the top of the hour. And we're going to get an update live from Downing Street on that meeting very shortly. Of course, we want your views on what should the leaders be discussing behind that famous black door right now. Send them in to uh, gbnews.com forward slash your say. Yes, will Kagame be asking for more money? <laughs> what will be said? Uh, let us know. This is Good Afternoon Britain. We're on GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. The perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in, you know, very casual exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be, and somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, the, what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time? You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking. Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like one I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that. But from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective, protective characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested uh, merely for quoting the Bible um, and without actually intending you know, anything beyond that. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain, live from Downing Street, where the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, is leaving after a 25-minute meeting with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. You can see his motorcade just rolling out of Downing Street as we speak. Yes, less than half an hour spent inside Number 10 discussing, presumably, the Rwanda deportation plan. Very short meeting. Very short meeting. Is that meeting. common, Tom, for presidents of country to visit just a whistle-stop whistle -stop, uh, tour of the United Kingdom into Number 10 mm. and then out again? Well, it's important to stress this isn't a state visit. This isn't uh, one of the grand occasions of state. Well, remember... Oh, when there's it, a red carpet. There is a red carpet, but this isn't a... St when, it, when there's a state visit, the royal family are involved, there are grand banquets, there are uh, moments to meet the public. It's a much bigger state of affairs. This is a working visit. So it's a very, very different set of affairs. Now, I I'm trying to think off the top of my head about previous meetings that I've seen in Downing Street between world leaders. And half an hour, it does happen when it's sort of smaller countries. Generally, the Prime Minister will devote, you know, half an hour of his itinerary to that. Because, of course, the Prime Minister is very, very busy throughout the day. But I would have thought that Rwanda... Because it's not just any old small African country with a small economy. This is quite an important part well, of the United Kingdom. Rishi Sunak's Kingdom. political career depends on Rwanda and depends, arguably, on his relationship with the president of Rwanda in terms of getting this Stop the Boats policy off the ground, the Rwanda deportation plan, I think it seems like quite a short amount of time. I think it does. When you consider they'll have walked in, we saw the photographs being taken, we saw that peak through the number 10 door, that little intricate inside view of the number 10 official photographers taking those pictures. There will have been no doubt time before the meeting and mm. after the meeting. How long were they actually sat down together for? Now, um, I'm going to be getting a readout of what they discussed from Number 10 later in the programme, so we'll be able to tell you precisely what went on. Also, our woman on the ground, Catherine Forster, will be live in Downing Street for us. So some of these questions will be answered, but if you have anything you would like us to ask Catherine Forster live from Downing Street, do get in touch, gbnews.com forward slash your say. Yes, perhaps they just got straight down to business. Mm. Or perhaps it was more about the uh, photo shoot. <laughs> we shall find out for Are you, you. You're not suggesting that Rishi Sunak is only there for a photo shoot? No, of course not. No. Never, never. But moving on. Now, a 25-year-old man has been arrested in Aylesbury on suspicion of murdering a woman in Bradford on Saturday. Yes, 27-year-old Kulsama actor was stabbed in the neck while she was pushing her baby down the high street. Well, GB News Yorkshire and Humber reporter Anna Riley is in Bradford. Uh, Anna, thank you very much. You've been following this horrific story here. When was this arrest made? Yes, a truly horrific story. This arrest was made in the early hours of this morning. Uh, the arrest made in Aylesbury, as you say, in Buckinghamshire, more than 150 miles away from Bradford, where the murder took place. Uh, police say that the 25-year-old man that they arrested was from Oldham. They thanked the Thames Valley Police for their help in this investigation that, that sparked a, a manhunt for more than three days. As part of their um, investigation, they've told us that they are no longer searching for Habiba Massam, but they've not yet named this 25-year-old man that's been arrested. We're waiting on that. But like you say, just a truly tragic case. The uh, victim, 27-year-old uh, woman who was stabbed to death in broad daylight while she was pushing her baby in a pram, just uh, was unfathomable for people that witnessed it. We spoke to Gio Khan yesterday. He was a shopkeeper who tried to assist uh, the woman as she lay 
dying and was helped with a, a passerby who was a doctor. They just described the scene and he, the shopkeeper told us that he knew her as well and that she visited his shop regularly for the past few weeks and that she was a happy woman that always had a smile on her face. So something that's really rocked the community but yet the latest is 25 year old man from Oldham arrested in Aylesbury and as we have more on this we will be able to bring it to you. Brilliant, Anna. Well, thank you very much for bringing us the very latest there live from Bradford from the scene of that awful stabbing just a few days ago. Absolutely horrendous. Well, coming up, we're going to be getting the details from that meeting between the president of Rwanda and Rishi Sunak. They were in there for about 20, 25 mm. minutes. What was said? What did they decide? Any developments? I have to say, Paul has written in to say Kagami leaves after 25 minutes. It takes three minutes for Rishi Sunak to sign a cheque. What were they doing for the other 22 minutes? Well, everyone is cynical. <laughs> everyone is cynical. How long has this been in the works for? Well, quite some time. Quite some time. Well, this is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 12.31. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kulsuma Akta died after being stabbed on Westgate in Bradford. Police then launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as people smugglers clashed with asylum seekers trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two of the migrants being stabbed multiple times. The incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from a large group of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been meeting with the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in Downing Street. The visit comes as it was revealed that some of the housing built to accommodate migrants after they are deported has been sold to locals. Lead campaigner and former sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Horizon IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led the post office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in the Horizon software system. Mr Bates is giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office and Fujitsu, which built the computer software at the heart of the scandal. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. The latest GB News travel. Westbound on the M8, the entry slip road at Junction 11 is partially blocked to flooding. Traffic is coping well. On the southbound side of the M18, there's a lane closure on the exit slip road to Junction 2 for the A1M to a broken down vehicle. Again, traffic coping well there. As well as on the A1M southbound, there is a lane closure to emergency repairs from Junctions 53 for Scotch Corner through to Junction 52. Slow for the clockwise side of the M25, there's queue and traffic to an earlier accident just before Maple Cross at 17. Delays are to Junction 16, even though all lanes have reopened. London bound, though, on the M3. All lanes have reopened just after Junction 4. An earlier broken down vehicle removed and traffic coping well. And that's the very latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the 
next election, I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose, and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously, maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. It's 12.36, you're watching Listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, a former nurse has been sentenced to seven years in jail for the ill treatment of a child. Yes, Tracy Menhinick was found guilty of harming a child with laxatives over a three-year period, which affected his development. Well, let's cross to Glasgow High Court, where our Scotland reporter Tony Maguire has been following the story for us. Tony, what do we know? Good afternoon. Yes, well, this morning Tracy Menhinick was sentenced to seven years in prison after quite a lengthy trial, it has to be said. Um, she was found guilty in February this year um, after a 19-day trial poured through around 5,500 pages of documents and yet the jury took only around an hour to convict. Now, um, a previous sentencing hearing had been called in March but that was delayed so that um, the, ju the judge could receive a psychiatric report. Now, Tracy Menhenick, she was a former NHS nurse, as you say. She was the carer for a, a young boy who cannot be named for legal reasons. And over the course of three years, between April 2014 and July 2017, she um, forced him to take laxatives to the point that he almost lost his life. Now the court heard that um, the long-term impacts of this are going to be you know, a really exhaustive list and quite, um, quite a sad tale altogether, this. Now, um, she um, had high expectations that this young boy is going to go through life now with learning difficulties. He already has a permanent disfigurement and stunted growth. Now, one of the doctors who was involved in the case um, to help the judge come to this decision, well, he said that when the, the young man arrived at Great Ormond Street Hospital, his body looked emaciated. And Tracy Min Hinkin, she stood by while ju uh, doctors, sorry, baffled by the, boy, the boy's body's reluctance to improve in any way whatsoever, and several operations were performed to improve his condition. Now, um, late, um, Judge Lady Drummond, she said that the only fitting case for this would be a lengthy and substantial one, and one that shows the... Um, sorry, and one that actually echoes the, the horror of what she's done in the eyes of the public. Um, now, her defence, that, as I said, that psychiatric report had come in today. Her defence counsel went through it um, with the judge. Um, the defendant herself, she had um, quite a, what her defence counsel called um, a, a huge list of, of her own health grievances um, and the judges has asked that they take any consideration by the penal system, but in the end seven years in jail um, for poisoning this little young man over, over three years. 
It's a really shocking story, story, Tony, and the more that we learn about it, the more I think people just find it very, very hard to believe. I mean, this is a situation where we could have been talking about a murder here had this not been stopped at the, by the time it was stopped. Really, really concerning stuff. Um, but, Tony, while you're here, there's another concerning story north of the border just developing today concerning the First Minister's brother-in-law, uh, the brother of the wife of Hamza Youssef. Uh, what's going on here? Um, indeed, well, this um, refers to Ramsey El Nakla, as you know, is the is the brother-in-law of the First Minister, the brother of his wife, and he had been now um, charged with abduction and extortion. Now, this is all in relation to a case in Dundee where a man fell from a window and later died in hospital. Um, we know that he's the fourth person to appear really um, in connection to this. Um, someone last week, Jennifer Souter, um, 38, she appeared in Dundee Shed of Court on Thursday last week um, of culpable, charged with culpable homicide. However, um, she did not enter any plea at that time. Um, and certainly um, it's going to be yet another um, you know, heavy topic on the plate of the First Minister with everything that he's got going on in his day job. But as we've seen really over the last six months, um, you know, he he is is he has some experience now of balancing the severe personal life with the, the severe day job, as we say. Very much for bringing us that uh, live from uh, from Glasgow there, but of course uh, Ramsey El Naka, the, uh, the the brother-in-law of the first minister, he'll be appearing at Dundee Sheriff Court later on. Yes, arrested and charged with abduction and extortion, following a man dying falling from a window. Hmm. Well, we'll bring you any updates as and when we get them. But in other news. A holiday park in West Sussex has had to be evacuated after a get to high ground warning because there's flooding, 65 mile per hour winds hitting the area overnight. The South East Coast Ambulance said uh, a number of resources were sent to help evacuate and rescue people from Medmury Holiday Park. Yes, this all comes as high tides and strong winds led to coastal flooding in parts of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Let's cross to Ray Addison now, our GB News reporter, joining us from West Sussex. And Ray, I hope you can hear me over the wind. It does seem like uh, the weather has been pretty severe in this area. Absolutely. The, the advice from emergency services has been to find some high ground, and that's what I've attempted to do here. I've made my way down to Bracklesham Bay. Now, it's uh, between uh, Selsey and East Wittering, for those who know this part of the coast, uh, near to Chichester as well. Now, this um, Medmerry Park that we've been hearing about, around 100 people have been evacuated from there due to this severe flooding. Now, um, I'm attempting to make my way way down there shortly. The, the floodwaters have started to um, withdraw, I've been told. But along the way, I saw here the uh, Bracklesham Bay Caravan and Boat Park. I'm just going to move out of the way so you can take a look. So it shows you an indication now. It's not just the Med Mary that is struggling and has uh, needed the help from emergency services. When I was walking along here earlier on, there was teams, uh, emergency service teams with canoes uh, probing the water and going from uh, chalet caravan to caravan, uh, checking to see if there was anybody there who needed help or needed uh, evacuation, presumably probing the water to see if there was anybody uh, that was struggling because of this water that has come in here. And you might just be able to see in the distance as well, um, these, uh, the sea there and those waves that are pounding in. The winds are around about 65 uh, miles an hour uh, at the moment, of course, right here. Uh, on the coast and over the overnight we saw those rising tides really affecting all of these holiday parks along here meaning that a number of them have actually been shut just getting back to uh, Medmerry. Now, the road in and out, there's only one a very small country road in and out of, of Medmerry because it's quite a rural area around here. That's actually been blocked off by police. So 
They're taking people out, shut the park, trying to make sure that nobody gets into that area because of the severe concerns about these uh, the, the the flooding from uh, the water here. Of course, we've seen a lot of rain as well, and there's a lot of been a lot of travel disruption, disruption to businesses as well due to the amount of rain that we've seen um, and flooding and pooling. So we've seen train disruption too. Um, now Hampshire has been affected. Uh, the uh, railway at Livington Pier, uh, coastal roads as well have all been left uh, impassable in parts of Southampton too. So a number of uh, issues being caused by these severe weather conditions. Absolute disaster if you are planning for a relaxing holiday and that's what you get. Yeah. Flooding, evacuation and high winds. Thank you so much for braving the elements for us. Ray Addison, our reporter who is in West Sussex. What an absolute disaster. Yeah, no, not what you want. I suppose April's not normally the driest month, but you certainly don't well, expect... Can you imagine? You're planning flooding. to have barbecues, nice walks, go mm. down to the beach, have a lovely time with your family or friends, and what you get is gale force winds mm. and flooding and an evacuation. No, not what not, you want. Not the holiday that your family might have dreamed of. But <laughs> no, um, stay with not us. Not at all. You can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> because very shortly we'll be discussing how day turns to night for millions of people across North America as the total solar eclipse swept that continent. This is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's feeling much cooler out there today than yesterday. There are rain and wind warnings in force, but it will turn somewhat drier this evening. That's this area of low pressure, which will bring some persistent rain to some through the rest of the day, gets replaced by this ridge of higher pressure through, through this evening and overnight. But before then, some very persistent rain to come for many areas of northern England, much of Scotland as well. There is a rain warning in force for southern areas of Scotland, so there could be some disruption from the rainfall. The winds are also going to be very strong everywhere across the UK, but in particular across the west coast of Wales, northwest England as well. So it's going to be feeling particularly chilly exposed to that wind. But across parts of Northern Ireland, Wales and into southern England, it should be drier with a chance of some sunny spells through the rest of the afternoon. Overnight tonight, the low pressure pushes away and it turns dry and clear for the bulk of the UK overnight. But that will allow temperatures to fall away. So it's going to be a chillier night than of late with a touch of frost expected for parts of Scotland as well as northern England. However, from the west, we'll start to see cloud thicken through Wednesday morning. So Northern Ireland will likely see a bit of a wetter start. That rain will spread into South Wales, the southwest through the first hours of the morning and then elsewhere across the country later on. So after a brighter start, you'll likely see some rain and cloudier skies later on in the day. The rain will put turn quite persistent across western areas of Scotland as well. And here there's a rain warning in force, but it does introduce much milder air. So it will be a warmer day. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Now, stay with us. It's uh, coming up to 10 minutes to one. And in just a moment, we'll be having 
a live exclusive from our very own Mark White. Some clashes down on the south coast. But before then, millions of people across the United States, Mexico and Canada watched in wonder yesterday as day turns to night following the total solar eclipse which swept through North America. Yes, the moon completely covered the sun for over four minutes in some areas. However, back home in the UK, most areas missed out because of cloud cover. Well, we'll be joining now uh, with the space expert, Andy Lound, to discuss this. And Andy, uh, amazing scenes in America, but many Brits disappointed. Good morning. Yes, it was spectacular, wasn't it? It was always going to be difficult for the UK anyway because the sun would be quite low in the sky and we're only going to get a partial eclipse. But across the USA what a, and, and Canada and Mexico, what a spectacular sight it was. We managed to get to see quite quite an interesting set of data from that as well. We we managed to see the um, prominences, uh, that's a beautiful red prominences popping up, which was beautiful and they stood out quite well. The corona looked absolutely fantastic. This was the, the the white glow, the big white glow around the uh, the eclipse itself, which is really important. We don't see that unless we get an eclipse. So that was quite a, a wonderful sight to see that. We saw streamers coming from it as well. And again, and the the prominences and the streamers are all effects of the magnetic field on the sun itself. And that's really important now because we're at solar maximum, a maximum time of activity. And that photograph there shows it beautifully. It's a fantastic corona. I mean, the important thing when we're studying this, the corona is, is about a million degrees centigrade and it's hotter than the photosphere, which is about 5,500 degrees. And the photosphere is the bright bit that we normally see. So once you block out that, you see this really hot uh, atmosphere of the sun. And we don't know still fully why the outer atmosphere of the sun is a lot hotter. It, it's a very great mystery for us. It could be to do with the magnetic fields and the prominences transferring energy, which is why spacecraft are out there looking at it. But what a spectacular sight for the public. And it was a good, it's another piece of evidence here that, that science is far better than magic and superstition. Mm -hmm. Science is the thing which can excite you. Yes, it's magical. Um, Andy, it wasn't all fun and games for everyone, though. I'm seeing that lots of people over in the States were, are complaining that their eyes are boiling as a result of looking at the solar eclipse. Even some who were wearing what glasses. Apparently, Andy, Google searches for eye pain spiked. Some people oh, sit, aren't yeah. reading the advice, are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if you followed the advice exactly, then you would be absolutely fine. I mean, when, when I did a, a public awareness activity across Libya in 2006, we had a very strict regulation going on there. Uh, the rule was put your eyes down, put the, gla put the glasses on and hold them salute and look up and that actually gave you some shielding from the top and then you only did it for a short period of time then went down again and reversed the process if people just stood there looking directly which you should never do constantly and constantly of course you're going to get heat going into, into your face it's common sense mm. uh, but we're in a world where common sense will not be tolerated unfortunately um, but if people had followed the instructions in astronomy societies and universities i know for a fact we're out there giving good advice mm. then they they should have been fine. It's beggar's belief, isn't it? That it, it you can't does. regulate dumb dumbs, can <laughs> yeah, you? I mean, my goodness, I, I've, I've just stared directly into the sun, Googling, why do my eyes hurt? I mean, I mean my <laughs> goodness me. Uh, but uh, but Andy, I just... The fire and it burned. <laughs> <laughs> just finally, when will we be able to see the next eclipse? Is there anything coming a bit closer to this part of the world in the coming years? Always wanting more. There is, in August 2026. Uh, North Spain and North Portugal. That's a close. That's the closest point to us we can get to it. It moves across across further, um, unless you want to go to Greenland, of course. I mean, there, there are trips to Greenland, but they're mega bucks. But yes, mm -hmm. Northern Spain and Northern Northern Portugal, fantastic place to go. People will like it for the holidays. Um, so yes, it's very close at hand. And a year after that, there's Gibraltar. So oh. yes, it's, it's very close at hand. Gibraltar. British soil. Yeah. That's what we like to see. Uh, my goodness, I suppose if we, if we get booking in these flights now, they might be a bit cheaper than a bit closer to the time. But uh, Andy, thank you very much for that. I've got 2020 Thank you. written down here. We'll add that to the diary.
We can we can go uh, present. We can host oh, our show yes. from North Portugal. Well, there yeah, we go. Thank absolutely. you very much indeed, Andy Land, who is, of course, a space expert and enthusiast. Now, stay with us here on GB News because we're going to be debating whether or not we should allow Russian athletes to compete in the Paris Olympics. A massive controversial issue today. The United Kingdom has just switched its position. We're going to get the view of a Ukrainian and of a Russian. Very interesting stuff. Not just that, though. Also, Mark White will be live with us at the top of the next hour. He's got a live exclusive from the South Coast. Find out what it is after this. This is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's feeling much cooler out there today than yesterday. There are rain and wind warnings in force, but it will turn somewhat drier this evening. That's just this area of low pressure, which will bring some persistent rain to some through the rest of the day, gets replaced by this ridge of higher pressure through, through this evening and overnight. But before then, some very persistent rain to come for many areas of northern England, much of Scotland as well. There is a rain warning in force for southern areas of Scotland, so there could be some disruption from the rainfall. The winds are also going to be very strong everywhere across the UK, but in particular across the west coast of Wales, northwest England as well. So it's going to be feeling particularly chilly exposed to that wind. But across parts of Northern Ireland, Wales and into southern England, it should be drier with a chance of some sunny spells through the rest of the afternoon. Overnight tonight, the low pressure pushes away and it turns dry and clear for the bulk of the UK overnight. But that will allow temperatures to fall away. So it's going to be a chillier night than of late with a touch of frost expected for parts of Scotland as well as northern England. However, from the west, we'll start to see cloud thicken through Wednesday morning. So Northern Ireland will likely see a bit of a wetter start. That rain will spread into South Wales, the southwest through the first hours of the morning and then elsewhere across the country later on. So after a brighter start, you'll likely see some rain and cloudier skies later on in the day. The rain will put turn quite persistent across western areas of Scotland as well. And here there's a rain warning in force, but it does introduce much milder air. So it will be a warmer day. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA <laughs> victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Did you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of making your mind up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... Abba was 74, I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, 
it was only months after ABBA's performance that I, um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing, but the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Tuesday, the 9th of April. Lock them up. Alan Bates, the superstar sub postmaster, has come out swinging at the post office inquiry. Mr Bates says bosses should be clawed back, bonuses should be clawed back from bosses, and prosecutions should be made. And migrants have clashed with people smugglers in France with six people injured. GB News can reveal that the latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk. We'll have the very latest. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak welcomes the Rwandan president to number 10. It comes as reports that a majority of homes secured for the Prime Minister's flagship asylum speaker scheme have been sold within Rwanda. We'll have the details of that meeting. And question for you, should Russian athletes be allowed to compete at the Paris Olympics? The UK government feels they should, but under a neutral flag. It's something we'll be debating this hour. Get your views in. Yes, well, it's been reported that the government have sort of backtracked on their early, earlier position when it comes to Rus Russian athletes being able to compete in the Olympics. It was that the culture secretary made it very clear that she did not think Russian athletes should compete. That was last spring. Mm. Now it seems the position has changed. It's mellowed a little bit. And... Russian athletes should be allowed to compete if they have a neutral flag, they won't have their national anthem, there will be checks to see their background and whether they're in favour of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Do you think it's the right balance? No, actually, because this is the balance that we saw in 2021 in those Olympic Games where the Russian athletes competed as ROC, the Russian Olympic Committee. They had just a flag of the Olympic rings. They couldn't have their national anthem. Why is it exactly the same now as it was in 2021? That doesn't, to me, make any sense. And also, it just seems a little bit pathetic, doesn't it? Well, so it you seems think they weak in the face of aggression. So you think that all Russian athletes should just be banned outright, even though, as individuals, they haven't done anything wrong? Well, the Russian athletes in the past have done plenty wrong. Well, it should be done on a case-by-case the, case basis, the, 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 the athletes from the USSR were, were, were absolutely injected up to their eyeballs with all sorts of performance-enhancing drugs. I'm just not sure when it comes to banning Russian athletes that it will have any impact on Vladimir Look, Putin we know the Russians aggression. cheat. We know the Russians cheat. And we know that Russian athletes have been banned for cheating in the past. That, as well as the aggression of this, of the Russian state... Two different, I mean, two different I think, issues. I so. think bad country, bad country should not be represented at the Olympics. But hang on, lots of people have been... Uh, I think you're wrong on this one. Okay. But I'm very interested to hear what the, you at home make of this. GVnews.com forward slash your say. We are going to be hearing the views of a Russian and a Ukrainian. They'll be debating it going head to head in just a little bit. So make sure you get your views in. Who do you agree with? Who do you agree with? Do you think Russian athletes should be outright banned from taking part in the Olympics in this year? <laughs> Good afternoon. It's three minutes past one. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kolsuma Akta died after being stabbed in Westgate in Bradford. Police then launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, murder squad detectives are investigating after a woman was found stabbed to death in central London. The victim was discovered dead, having suffered multiple stab wounds in her home near Hyde Park. 
The Metropolitan Police say they are working 24-7 to identify and arrest whoever may be responsible for the attack. Lead campaigner and former sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Horizon IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led the post office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in the Horizon software system. Mr Bates is giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office and Fujitsu, which built the computer software at the heart of the scandal. When Horizon came in, I think I was quite positive about it um, because I, I knew what technology and these sorts of systems could do, so um, I, I was quite positive. But I, I found it a bit frustrating once the system was installed and we were operating. I, I found there were many shortcomings in the system and um, knowing what these systems could do, it just seemed a bit of a lost opportunity. In other news, six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as smugglers clashed with asylum seekers trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two of the migrants being stabbed multiple times. The incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from large groups of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has met the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in Downing Street. The visit comes as it was revealed that some of the housing built to accommodate migrants after they are deported had been sold to locals. Labour is set to announce a new crackdown on tax avoiders today in a bid to help fund the NHS. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will pledge to raise over £5 billion per year, which Labour would use to tackle NHS waiting lists and fund free school breakfast clubs. The party has said it will also raise £2.6 billion over the next parliament by closing loopholes in the government's plans to abolish exemptions for non-DOMs. Shadow Financial Secretary James Murray says it's wrong that some people are getting away without paying what they owe. We're setting up our plans today to crack down on that tax avoidance and to get that money um, into the public purse because, you know, when people right across Britain are paying more and more tax, uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. We've been setting out for a number of years about ending a non-DOM tax status. The government said they wanted to follow our lead after years of saying they wouldn't, uh, but they're leaving open loopholes in that, which means that people can avoid paying hundreds of millions of pounds of tax. So we want to close those loopholes, but that's part of a broader approach approach to investment in HMRC. And the Foreign Secretary has met Donald Trump in Florida as he looks to shore up support for Ukraine. Lord Cameron's meeting with Mr Trump follows reports claiming the former US president said he could end the Russia-Ukraine war within 24 hours if re-elected. The two men discussed the war in Ukraine, NATO and the Middle East. It is a first summit between a senior government minister and the former president since he left office in 2021. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary will hold talks with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington, D.C. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Now it's back to Tom and Emily. Good afternoon, Britain. It is seven minutes past one. And now, GB News can reveal France is battling against a series of migrant-related violent incidents. Yes, after a migrant was stabbed to death near Dunkirk last week, a video posted to social media shows migrants clashing with people smugglers as they try to force themselves onto small boats without paying. Well, joining us now to discuss this is our Home and Security editor, Mark White. And, Mark, what have you found? Well, it is growing levels of violence now in northern France, and that's violence really amongst migrants uh, who are clashing with people smuggling gangs, and also the migrants clashing with French authorities. It's getting really quite violent. We're seeing uh, pretty much on a daily basis now violence erupting across northern France. The video you're looking at there is the latest example of that. It's on a beach called Wee Plage, which is near Dunkirk. 
Um, there are a group of migrants in the video that you're seeing just now are clashing with French police who've moved in to do what the French police try to do when they get an, uh, an idea that there is a boat about to launch, which is to get up to that boat and to puncture it. Uh, this occasion saw the police being pelted with stones and sticks and bottles. Uh, the police fired tear gas back, but eventually they were forced to retreat onto their beach buggies and escape uh, the beach itself because it was just too violent for them there. And in addition to that, uh, this migrant on migrant violence uh, that we've been seeing escalating as well. So on that same stretch of beach, uh, just a short while before these video images were taken, a big uh, uh, eruption of violence that took place in which uh, at least six migrants were injured, two of them were stabbed multiple times. And what we believe that was uh, sparked by uh, was attempts by some of the migrants to get onto these dinghies without paying the people smugglers. Sources have told us that uh, African migrants in particular simply don't have the money to pay the people smugglers thousands of pounds to get on these boats. And what they do instead is they wait for the boats to launch and then they try and rush the boats and just push their way on. But of course they come again, uh, up against the people smugglers. Uh, many of the people smugglers are armed uh, and they meet out their own form of justice. and on occasions that can involve migrants being stabbed. So two migrants, a Sudanese man aged 20, a 24-year-old Sudanese woman suffered multiple stab injuries. Four, that, four others uh, suffered less serious stab injuries. And this follows an incident just a week ago uh, at a, a migrant camp not far from this beach near Dunkirk where another migrant was stabbed to death. So really quite serious situation that is now escalating, uh, worsening uh, on a daily basis. And Mark, why do you suspect these violent clashes are increasing in frequency? Well, there's a desperation. There's a desperation on the part of those migrants, as I say, mainly African migrants who cannot afford the thousands of pounds to get on the small boats, and the determination of the criminal gangs to jealously guard the business they have. Clearly, from their point of view, they don't want people getting on these boats and not paying them. They're making millions of pounds in a good week in the English Channel by pushing these boats out. But because of that business model, just like the ruthless business model we see with the drugs industry, uh, these people smuggling gangs are just as ruthless in the way that they enforce the business model that they have. And anyone not willing to conform to that, anyone trying to push their way onto the boats, are dealt with very violently indeed. But as I say, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is the fact that the French authorities are increasing increasingly meeting uh, what is uh, quite a violent response from the migrants as the French continue with the tactics of trying to puncture those boats. It really does make you think for the people that are trying to enforce this. There are now uh, joint patrols in some areas of these beaches. Much, much British taxpayer money has been going to, to fund these patrols. But to be honest, you can see what a tricky, tricky task it is when they're met with such violence and resistance from some of these migrants. Uh, Mark White, thank you so much for bringing us the very latest there concerning scenes on those French beaches. Very concerning indeed. But of course, this all comes as Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, meets with Rishi Sunak. This was him leaving around half an hour ago. We can see pictures of the president leaving uh, number 10 Downing Street down the red carpet, out onto uh, Downing Street, and back into his Range Rover there. Um, so, what was going on in that meeting? What was said? Joining us now is our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. What do we know about why this meeting took place and what was discussed? Well, Number 10 are being very tight-lipped. When I spoke to them shortly after the meeting, we will be getting more information later, but quite a quick meeting, only about 20 minutes or so. The president only here uh, for one day. And it comes, of course, um, 
on rather an embarrassing day, given the story in The Times this morning, that basically one of the estates that had been built to house the migrants that we're uh, supposed to be going to centre Rwanda, bear in mind this was a scheme first announced in April 2022, we still haven't managed to send a single person to Rwanda, that one of these housing estates, 70% of the houses have in fact been sold off to locals. This particular estate, the former Home Secretary Soella Braverman visited last year. She said the houses were beautiful. She said she wanted tips from the interior designer, um, but a lot of them have already been sold. So if and when these flights go to Rwanda or on that particular estate, uh, there's not many houses left for them. now. Rwandan officials say, look, this was always the plan that uh, migrants were going to be integrated within the community. They said they never wanted to have what they called migrant ghettos. Uh, Suella Braverman, for her part, is already saying, well, I'm very disappointed to hear this because the whole point of the Rwanda plan was to send many, many hundreds of people to Rwanda. If it's just a token flight or two, that is not going to cut the mustard at all. So we'll see what emerges from this meeting later. Um, the safety of Rwanda bill, of course, back in Parliament last week. The government hopeful still of getting flights off by the summer. Now the Easter recess, Catherine, of Parliament ends on the 15th of April. The start of next week is a new parliamentary term. MPs return to their jobs. Are we expecting to see the Rwanda legislation finally get back to the House of Commons that very week? Yes, absolutely. Um, the government want to make this a priority, want to get this through. They hope it will get through Parliament uh, next week, as soon as Parliament gets back, basically, and then will pass into law by the end of April. They then expect uh, a few weeks, up to six weeks, getting everything ready before people finally get on flights to Rwanda. Um, one little bit of good news for the government. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has basically toughened the criteria for an interim injunction to be granted. Remember, there was a plane with migrants on the tarmac, one by one. Uh, they were taken off by the European Court of Human Rights. They have made it more difficult for that to happen because what they've said now is it will only be if there is an imminent risk of irreparable harm and it will only be used in exceptional cases. So let's see. Well, thank you very much indeed, Catherine. And please do come back to us when you have the details of what was going on in that meeting when you hear from the Prime Minister and his team. I wonder what mm. they'll put out. I have to say, talking to Catherine there, we had all those pictures. We saw, we saw the President walk in, sit down in a chair and then walk out, almost in real time. <laughs> across Are you the suggesting entire... that maybe not that much was said? I'm saying I'm sure they had some lovely photographs taken. Well, in other news, <laughs> Alan Bates, who led the campaign for justice in the post office scandal and had his story turned into an ITV drama, is giving evidence to the post office inquiry today. Yes, he's told the inquiry that the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him and that the cause of fighting for justice was something you just couldn't put down. Well, now we're joined by Vijay Parekh, a former sub-postmaster himself who was jailed after being accused of stealing £78,000 emitting theft. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's really great to get your perspective on this. You've gone through this yourself. Um, what are you hoping that this inquiry, what are you um, hoping the outcome of this inquiry is? That the post office were wrong in prosecuting us and uh, get to the bottom of this. It's a, it's a simple ask, I suppose, that that people apologise because there have been so many people at the very top of so many of these institutions, people who have been at the top of so many parts of British society, who have been, frankly, trying to wash their hands of this, saying, it wasn't me, Gov, I didn't know. What do you think should happen to the people who have been right at the top of these organisations, Paula Venels, or even post office ministers of successive governments? But this has been going on since 1999, when Pujitsu told post office that there's problems and bugs in the horizon system. So they've been hiding it, so they need to be prosecuted 
as soon as it's they can. And what would you say about Alan Bates? He has been a key figure in this campaign, trying to fight for justice for postmasters. Um, what would your words to him be today while he faces the inquiry? Well done, and ca carry on with the way he's working and helping all the rest of the postmasters who have had this problem. It's such a heart-wrenching case for so many people, obviously dramatised in that fantastic uh, docudrama on ITV. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your personal situation? Uh, what, what did you lose as a result of this faulty software and the refusal of post office management to admit it? I've lost uh, the whole business. The residents had to remortgage, went into bankruptcy because of their negligence. It's a really, really sad tale. So many people in your position lost so much, so many years where their business, their home, uh, their reputation has been dragged through the mud. We really appreciate your time for talking through your own situation. Vijay Parekh, uh, former sub-postmaster, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, coming up, our debate this hour. Should Russian athletes be allowed to compete in the Paris Olympic Games? The government has been accused of U-turning on this very issue. We'll get two sides of this debate, a Russian and a Ukrainian voice to gbnews.com forward slash your stay. Say Stay with us. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of the sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke, and there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes. Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of Companies Fixing Things That Weren't Broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. The, yeah, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's 23 minutes past one. Now, we're talking the, this hour about the Olympic Games. Why? Because Britain has just changed our attitude to one participant. Yes, the United Kingdom wanted Russia to be excluded from this year's Games, but has just changed its position. Now, the United Kingdom government are accepting Russia's participation under a blank flag. Yes, lots of you have been getting in touch already. Um, I suggested that perhaps we shouldn't punish individual Russian athletes off the basis of what Vladimir Putin is doing. Tom said exactly the reverse. You argued that actually it's absolutely right mm -hmm. to ban all Russian athletes and they shouldn't even be able to perform under a neutral flag. Uh, Dave says Tom is absolutely right. Russian athletes should not participate in the coming Olympic Games. You're going soft, Emily. <laughs> Am I going soft? Are you? Well, Surely John, not. John says the Russian state has continually shown a huge disregard for fair play and their stance on cheating using drugs speaks for itself. Their athletes are state actors. To the people who say Israelis should be banned, they're acting in defence, not the same as Russia invading a sovereign country. Yes, Virginia says, yes, they should be banned. They support Putin and Ukrainian war. Putin will be very angry if they're stopped from taking part as it's all a propaganda exercise. Very naive if you think otherwise. But Let's have this debate mm. um, because there are two very different views on this. I'm sure there's a multitude of different views on this. But uh, we have with us to discuss this the Russian journalist Alexei Viryazov, who thinks we should keep politics and sport separate, and the Ukrainian journalist Greg Herman, who thinks they shouldn't be allowed to compete unless athletes make a public statement condemning Putin. Well, that's very interesting. Greg, shall we start with you? So you believe they should be able to compete, but with very strict conditions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are people, yeah, they are sportsmen, they are good, may maybe they are good people, may good men and women, but they support Russian invasion as any uh, Russian sportsman. Look, there is no big Olympic sports in Russia without government's money, without government subsidies. And when they come to the level, they have to pay their bill, this bill. They have to be a part of the Russian propaganda machine. And that's the main point. You don't have in uh, Olympic uh, the, the sportsmen from Russia. You have the part of the propaganda. Well, let's throw that right back to Alexei Vyazov. Uh, Alexei, from Russia. Uh, um, uh, what do you make of that idea that when you're actually uh, performing a sport on behalf of your country, you might well be seen as a representative of that country. Well, I do agree that the Olympic Games are very politicized, even though I do think that we should keep sports and politics separate. Listen, I do not personally watch the Olympics, but last time I checked, it was a big deal for a lot of people, especially the athletes. Imagine preparing for something your whole life and then something like war in Ukraine happens and you are banned from participating in it or banned from participating under your own flag. Listen, a flag is a symbol that can mean different things for different people. And the thing about Russian or Belarusian athletes, they do not have a different flag. They only have that flag. And Russian flag, listen, the, the British flag used to stand for colonization and it does no longer. And, you know, I was in Paris la just last week, actually. And I was harassed by different people on two different occasions for wearing this Olympic sweater, which is the Soviet Olympic sweater. And it does not represent the invasion of Afghanistan or, or the occupation of Czechoslovakia. It's just a present given to me by my mom. And where I disagree with Greg, where I disagree with Greg, he says that Russian athletes participating in the Olympics gonna fuel the Russian propaganda. I think just the opposite. Alexi, to, to a lot of people looking at that sweater, mm -hmm. looking at the CCCP sweater there... Which means USSR. Uh, which means USSR uh, in, the, in the Russian alphabet. And, uh, wouldn't a lot of people be legitimately looking at that as a representation of a regime responsible for gulags, responsible for the slaughter of many people simply for, they, for, the, for the fact that they happen to own property, uh, responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people in the last century. And just as I said, it didn't happen that the UK changed its flag after the colonization era was over and you guys have colonized half of the world. It didn't happen that the Belgium have changed their flag after they were cutting off arms of kids in 
uh, Belgian Congo. So a flag is a symbol that can stand for many different things. And I believe as long as Russian athletes do not show up with Z emblems, which do signify the support of the special military operation, they should be allowed to participate under their flag. And as I was saying, the Olympic Committee banning Russian athletes from participating under their flag, that is exactly the thing that is going to fuel Russian propaganda. Because here at home, they will be told that, well, listen, we told you the whole world, mm. especially the West, is against you. That's exactly why you should stick with the regime and support the special military operation. Uh, maybe for some, but Alexei, the argument is that by banning Russian athletes, that will put pressure on Vladimir Putin to change his course of action. Do you completely disagree with that? It will have no impact on Putin. It's just a ridiculous argument because look at what Russia is doing now. Russia has organized games of the future. Russia will organize its own sports events. And if anything, such strong adamant opposition to Russia will put Russia on a pedestal and make Russia as the leader of uh, the whole world that is in opposition to the West. China will come, India will come, African countries will come. So. You're just making the martyr out of uh, Putin's regime by excluding Russian athletes from participating in the Olympic Games. And listen, the motto of the Olympic Games was higher, faster, stronger. Until recently, when they changed it to higher, faster, stronger, together, which is supposed to symbolize the unifying nature of sports mm -hmm. and making, making sports political and excluding Russian athletes from participating or participating under their own flag. That's just bad image for the West and for the Olympic Committee. Of course, the Olympics has a checkered history when it comes to glorifying regimes that were expansionist and exterminist with regard to the 1936 Olympic Games, which, of course, is a stain on Olympic legacies. So it was uh, covered in swastikas, held in Berlin, a moment for Adolf Hitler to showcase himself to the world. Might the uh, Olympic Committee be thinking uh, that they don't want to repeat the same mistake. They don't want to be glorifying any regimes that are expansionist or that are committing potential genocide. But listen, did the Olympic Committee exclude the UK or the United States from participating in the Olympic Games when they invaded Iraq? What are those double standards about? Why is the I'm Olympic so, sorry, Committee Greg, doing do nothing about comparable? Israel participating under their flag? Do you think it's comparable oh. to the United States and the United Kingdom to invade a country uh, that that was that was uh, exterminating the Kurds, that was uh, yeah. refusing to allow in the United Nations to look for weapons of mass destruction, that was not behaving in a way that any sort of country would. Do you think that's comparable to an unprovoked invasion of sovereign territory? Well, How do you think, not, I think? Let's, let's, let's... No. Please, Greg, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. no, 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 it's, it's let's, absolutely... Let's go back to Greg. Now Greg's back with us. Yeah, it's absolutely hi there again, and that's absolutely not uncomparable. It, it, it's it's absolutely bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I Look, apologize for that uh, language at this time of the day. I'm afraid. Yeah, Sorry yeah, yeah. For I, anyone that's I'm offended by that. Yeah, yeah. I'm apologize, and, and uh, but, but, but I'm very emotional because I see the man with the USSR shorts uh, on on your screen. They're telling us oh, you about the, the, USSR uh, the as true well. Olympic and the true Olympic. Period. Yeah. Let's remember. You're absolutely right. Let's remember Lili Riefenstahl movie about the Nazis Olympic. And let's remember what for Soviet Union and for Soviet sports was the Olympics. It was the stage. It was the stage to show the uh, Soviet and now uh, Russian importance for the world. This is the stage. This is just only the propaganda. N not anything else. Not anything else. And about the Iraq and the United States and the Great Britain, uh, let's remember that we have the United Nations solutions about the Iraq. We have the aggressions from Iraq to Kuwait. We have etc. 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 What we have here, we have independent country Ukraine, and we have the Russian Nazis that invade independent country with without any condemnation and. That's, that's the point. 
Right. Well, mm. thank you very much indeed to both of you. Greg Herman, Ukrainian journalist. Sorry that we lost you in the middle there. Um, and also to Alexei Virasov, Russian journalist there too. Thank it's you. a shame we lost Greg halfway through. Yes. No, but I think it was it was an interesting... An insight. And an insight. Uh, conversation. To what extent do uh, Olympians or athletes represent or, or, or speak for the countries that they are representing? I think far too often in history we have seen regimes use their athletes as a sort of arm of legitimacy. Absolutely, we have indeed, and it's good to point out the uh, historical comparisons, yeah. perhaps there, the parallels anyway. Now, in just a moment, we'll be discussing a child gender ID review, which is expected to advise that children should not be pushed into gender reassignment treatments, rather they should receive counselling to address associ associated mental health issues. Now, this is a big, key review that's been long awaited, but let's get your latest news headlines. It's 1.34, I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kulsuma Akhtar died after being stabbed on Westgate in Bradford. Police then launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as people smugglers clashed with asylum seekers trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two of the migrants being stabbed multiple times. The incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from a large group of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has met the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in Downing Street. The visit comes as it was revealed that some of the housing built to accommodate migrants there after they were deported has been sold to locals. Lead campaigner and former post sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Ryzen IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led the post office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in the Horizon software system. Mr Bates is giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office and Fujitsu, which built the computer software at the heart of the scandal. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2686 and €1.1671. The price of gold is £1,857.87 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,959 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's feeling much cooler out there today than yesterday. There are rain and wind warnings in force, but it will turn somewhat drier this evening. That's just this area of low pressure, which will bring some persistent rain to some through the rest of the day, gets replaced by this ridge of higher pressure through this evening and overnight. But before then, some very persistent rain to come for many areas of northern England, much of Scotland as well. There is a rain warning in force for southern areas of Scotland, so there could be some disruption from the rainfall. The winds are also going to be very strong everywhere across the UK, but in particular across the west coast of Wales, northwest England as well. So it's going to be feeling particularly chilly exposed to that wind. But across parts of Northern Ireland, Wales and into southern England, it should be drier with a chance of some sunny spells through the rest of the afternoon. Overnight tonight, the low pressure pushes away and it turns dry and clear for the bulk of the UK overnight. But that will allow temperatures to fall away. So it's going to be a chillier night than of late with a touch of frost expected for parts of Scotland 
Scotland as well as Northern England. However, from the west, we'll start to see cloud thicken through Wednesday morning. So Northern Ireland will likely see a bit of a wetter start. That rain will spread into South Wales, the southwest through the first hours of the morning and then elsewhere across the country later on. So after a brighter start, you'll likely see some rain and cloudier skies later on in the day. The rain will put turn quite persistent across western areas of Scotland as well. And here there's a rain warning in force, but it does introduce much milder air. So it will be a warmer day. The latest GB News travel. Hello, I'm John Vincent. Queues on the M62 westbound in West Yorkshire. There's a lane closed for an accident between Junction 23 Huddersfield and 22 Rishworth Moor, so we're seeing long delays there. Queues also in Manchester, firstly on the M66 southbound. We've got a lane closed for an accident between Junction 2 for Berry and 3 for Hollins. Also in Manchester, we're seeing slow traffic if you're heading outbound on the A57 Mancunian Way between Ancoats and Salford. Congestion in Cheshire, the A 55 westbound in Vickers Cross has been closed as a result of a police incident at the Vickers Cross interchange and we're seeing queues on the M487 bridge in Gloucestershire in both directions. Matrix signs set to 40 miles an hour there due to the strong winds. And that's your latest travel news. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 20 to 2. Now, young people who say they're transgender may have mental health problems. That's what a new review is expected to advise, that children are not pushed into gender reassignment reassignment treatments. It's expected to publish these findings tomorrow. Yes, instead they say that they should receive counselling to address potential mental health issues, a more holistic approach, one might say. Well, paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass will unveil her review, as we say, tomorrow. This comes as concerns rise surrounding children being allowed to identify as different genders at school without parental consent. Well, the teacher journalist and author of Transsexual Apostate, My Journey Back to Reality, Debbie Hayton, joins us now. Debbie, that sounds like a corker of a book. I must uh, get a copy. Um, Debbie, tell me what you make of this. We're hearing what is... Go the, the report is due to be published in in full tomorrow. This is long awaited. Do you agree with the central premise here that children who are suffering with gender dysphoria or say they are of another gender than they were born as, than they are bio biologically, should be treated more holistically than pushed down a sort of treatment uh, route or puberty blocker route or medicalisation? Well, of course it is. Of course this is welcome. This is something that should have been happening all along. Children struggling with any number of uh, issues growing up, the struggles with uh, the struggles that we all face uh, through puberty, for example, to uh, medicalise those, uh, those issues and prescribe puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and not give the children the support they need has been a, has been a, a huge abrogation of duty by the NHS. And it's good that uh, Dr. Cass has looked into this. And from what I understand, her report is going to uh, perhaps bring us back towards reality. Now, of course, uh, puberty blockers were developed in the early 1990s not to do with uh, transgender issues. They were to do with children who were going through early onset puberty who had other medical issues. They were approved by uh, the, the, the uh, administrative state in many different countries around the world for those specific ailments. Um, why is it, then, that there seems to be a growing movement to say they can never be used in the case of children who may be transgender, but they can be used in the case of children who are going through other issues. 
Well, it's what you mean by children who may be transgender. What do we actually understand by this? Now, the drugs which we're talking about were originally developed as cancer treatment. They prevent the uh, production of sex hormones in the body, uh, where those sex hormones are an agonist for uh, cancer. So that's where they were developed. They've also been used for chemical castration of, of sex offenders. And it's also been used, quite rightly, for children who undergo precocious puberty. So those are four, five, six-year-olds who start going through puberty. Shall, shall we be clear on the, uh, on the puberty blocker issue? Because I don't believe it's the case that those have been used for castration purposes. I think it might be that you're talking about cross-sex hormones that have been used I for those purposes. Uh, no, the, these drugs. I, I took these drugs myself, so I know what I know. I know what the, I know what those drugs do. What the, what puberty blockers do? This is the name we've given them. It sounds so harmless, puberty blockers. But these are these are drugs which uh, inhibit the production of the natural production of sex hormone in the in the uh, in the body. That's what they do, and that's where they're, they're used. Now, to use them in the case where children are going through puberty at age four, five, and six, and to put a break on that puberty until perhaps nine or ten is one thing. There's an obvious uh, there's an obvious therapeutic benefit for that. Mm. But to go to a thirteen year old or a fourteen year old and say we can stop this puberty for the time being to give you time to think uh, there is no basis in science to actually do that uh, 13 14 year olds have been have, have gone through this find that all their their peers all go through puberty leaving them behind so hence there is the clamor for cross-sex hormones and the child's body is then permanently changed and not in the way which uh, which it was it was which their body was had evolved to change. Uh, this has just been totally, totally wrong. In the absence of any controlled studies, this has been experimental treatment, which has gone on for far too long. Debbie, do you think gender dysphoria is a mental health illness? Uh, well, we can say, what is, what is gender dysphoria? This is another term which has been invented, and nobody really knows what it is. Is it a dissatisfaction with our sex bodies? Well, lots of people can can be dissatisfied with their sex bodies. Or is it, a, is it a label we put on some on something in order to access a certain treatment? Would, uh, would gender dysphoria actually exist as a diagnosis if there wasn't a treatment for it? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think there's lots of questions that need to be asked here. There's too many assumptions that have been made. There have, of course, been cases throughout history of people presenting as other genders. You can find cases in, in Roman times. You can find cases in Victorian times. You can kind of find We're talking cases about care for children, across, uh, adolescents across the world here, Tom. People. We're talking about care for children. We're talking about children potentially being mm. pushed down a path, mm. being affirmed, pushed down a path mm. where they have irreparable changes to their body made that they cannot then reverse. Debbie, this is more important yeah. than just talking about, yes, there has been well, well, transgender talking, people in the past. But if we're talking issue of about if trans Debbie, existed. we're talking about it's, children potentially having life-changing treatment, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, we, we can talk about characters in fiction. We can talk about Enid Blyton's George in The Famous Five, for goodness sake, who perhaps engaged in cross-gender behaviour, whatever we like to call it. But nobody said to George, the answer for all your problems mm. is, uh, is drugs and surgery to mm. permanently change your body. Uh, I think people the really said to George, important thing here, because we might be talking hmm. cross-purposes, the, the, the question I think that many transgender people would bring up is at what point is it okay for them to pursue uh, the, what they might describe as their authentic self? Should, should adults be able to change their sex hormones? And then that leads to the question, if there are people who really do believe that that is the path that they are destined for, that they must go on, in some cases might that not be easier before their this voice review comes. is into the treatment of children and adolescents, which is the subject of this conversation, isn't it, Debbie? Yeah, and I think we can draw a line between adults and children. An analogy mm. to take might be uh, might might be sterilisation treatment, vasectomies, for example. So we're quite happy for a 35-year-old who's had three children to have a vasectomy, but if an 18-year-old boy turned up for a vasectomy, we'd say this has got permanent repercussions. Go away and uh, go away and uh, come back later. So we're happy with that in in situations like that. And I don't see how this which can do exactly the same thing to our bodies, i.e. make them per permanently sterile, should be treated any differently. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Debbie Hayton. Great to get your opinion on all of this. Uh, teacher, journalist and author of Transsexual Apostate, My Journey Back to Reality. Well, thanks to Debbie, and I'm sure that everyone has lots and lots of views on that. Remember, of course, gbnews.com forward slash your say. But coming up, the warning to those in a holiday park battered by wind overnight, indeed even flooding. We'll get to that story. We're on the ground after the break. I'm Martin Daubney, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3pm. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians, and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalize the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 1.51. Now we're going straight to a holiday park in West Sussex that's been evacuated after a get-to-high-ground warning due to flooding and high winds. Let's go to our reporter, uh, Ray Addison there. Ray, what are the conditions like now? Well, still very, very windy and the conditions in the park, although the water is starting to retreat, you can really see the effects of that severe flooding in there. There's quite a large amount of water still there. You can see that there's been damage to the decks, damage to people's cars as well as they've been moved around by those currents. And also there's been shifting of some of the buildings within that park too. Now, at least 100 people have been evacuated overnight due to that severe flooding. It's only around 100 metres from the beach here and of course these rising tides, that 65 mile per hour winds as well has caused these problems. Now I'm joined now by Andy Stevens. He's from the Windrush Letting Agency involved with this park. Andy, thanks very much for, for joining me. Now you, you let a number of these properties to, uh, to tourists, to members of the public too. How are they reacting to this? 
Well, they've reacted very well. They've, they've, they've said that the services that came to rescue them um, behaved well and Cove, the, uh, the company that owns this site, moved them all over to uh, Seal Bay. And so we're very grateful for all of that. Um, but one customer, he contacted me this morning saying that he, um, he woke up about 1.30 and uh, he got out of bed because of the noise of the wind and he put his foot in water in the wow. bedroom. So that's how bad it was. Another customer, we've been in contact with all our customers, all the holiday makers that are there. And another, another one saw his car floating down. Um, so, but they all got out safely. Terrible, terrible situation to be in. Just quickly, obviously, it's not ideal for you either. You manage 15 of these properties. What state is your business in from, from this point on? Uh, sadly, it's uh, lost that part of the business at this precise moment. We don't know how quickly it can be returned. And it was sad because the business is actually up for sale at the moment. Um, so the price has been dropped quite a bit because of this. But it, when it picks up, um, which could be a while as we know it takes time to get uh, a thing sorted from flood, flood uh, flooded properties Andy Stevens, thank you very much for joining us. Of course, it's not just uh, the Med Mary Park that suffered these conditions as well. We know the Bracklesham Caravan and Boat Park too. That's completely flooded too as well. So it's really decimating this whole part of the coast. Just awful. Well, Ray Addison, thank you so much for bringing us that very live there from West Sussex. Now, coming up, a developing story. Arsenal and Man City Champions League games are threatened by Islamic State terrorists. Yes, you heard that correctly. We'll have the very latest on that immediate threat to the United Kingdom after this. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be turning a little bit drier through the rest of the day and into this evening with the rain and the wind easing. That's as this area of low pressure that's brought the windy and fairly wet weather pushes off into the North Sea and a ridge of higher pressure will arrive overnight. That's going to turn things drier through this evening across Northern Ireland, many western areas of the UK. Some rain still to come for the next few hours across the east coast of Scotland and Northern England. But then it turns considerably drier, so a clear night for most areas away from the far west and that's going to allow temperatures to dip down so it's going to be a much colder start tomorrow than of late we could see a touch of frost across some rural areas of scotland northeastern england as well and everywhere is going to feel on the chilly side However, wet weather will spread in from the west quite quickly through Wednesday, particularly across Northern Ireland first thing, but then into Wales, southwest England, and then into northwestern areas of Scotland. That's where the rain's going to be the most persistent, as well as across parts of the Lake District as well. So there is a rain warning in force, but this rain is going to be bringing with it much milder air. So it's going to be a warmer day tomorrow, and that warm feel will continue through the rest of the week. And it will turn a little bit drier for many areas. There will be a band of cloud and rain across the south coast from time to time through Thursday. But it does look like it will turn that much drier, with temperatures climbing to the high teens, possibly the low 20s by Friday. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel... Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Tuesday, the 9th of April. Now there's heightened security for Champions League games tonight. This comes after Islamic State supporting media published threats against these venues. Both Arsenal and Manchester City are in action. We'll bring you the very latest. Hugely concerning threats there. In other news, the Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron meets with Donald Trump in Florida, all before heading on to Washington, D.C. for talks. What on earth did they talk about? We'll speak to a former advisor of Donald Trump. And Council Fat Cats, it's revealed a record number of Town Hall staff are pocketing more than £150,000 a year. This despite households being slapped again with soaring council tax bills. Huge, huge news hour coming up. Not Absolutely. least, not least foreign affairs, but domestic threats too. Throughout it all, gbnews.com slash your say. That's the new way to get in touch with this programme. But crikey, Islamic State threats. They, these are things that I thought had been consigned to the history books. Yes, well, exactly. There's been messages put out essentially encouraging, encouraging those who are aligned to Islamic State to potentially target these footballing events. We're going to get the very latest on this, find out all the details of how severe this threat is, mm. but it looks deeply concerning. And even if there aren't soldiers being sent over or terrorists being sent over from the Middle East, any follower of that ideology based in this country, any lone wolf who's not even connected to the organisation of, of, of what calls itself Islamic State, will they be inspired by this message? That is a serious, serious element of concern. And, of course, as we say, heightened security at these stadiums now. Yes, we're going to dig into all the detail on that later in the show. And please do get in touch on everything we're going to be discussing, gbnews.com forward slash your say. We'll get to some of your views very soon indeed. But let's get your headlines. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past two. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story this hour. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kulsama Akhtar died after being stabbed on Westgate in Bradford. Police then launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, the Met Police has referred itself to the independent police watchdog after a woman was stabbed to death in central London. The victim was discovered dead, having suffered multiple stab wounds in her home near Hyde Park. 
Scotland Yard said officers were contacted on Sunday by friends of the woman who were concerned about her welfare. It was not until the next day that police forced entry to the woman's home. The Met Police say they are working 24-7 to identify and arrest whoever may be responsible for the attack. Lead campaigner and former sub-postmaster Alan Bates has told the Horizon IT inquiry the post office spent 23 years attempting to discredit and silence him. The inquiry has been probing the circumstances that led the post office to wrongly prosecute more than 900 sub-postmasters caused by errors in the Horizon software system. Mr Bates is giving his version of events ahead of appearances by senior executives from the post office and Fujitsu, which built the computer software at the heart of the scandal. When Horizon came in, I think I was quite positive about it um, because I, I knew what technology and these sorts of systems could do, so um, I, I was quite positive. But I, I found it a bit frustrating once the system was installed and we were operating. I, I found there were many shortcomings in the system and um, knowing what these systems could do it just seemed a bit of a lost opportunity. Six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as people smugglers clashed with asylum seekers trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two of the migrants being stabbed multiple times the incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from a large group of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has met the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in Downing Street. The visit comes as it was revealed that some of the housing built to accommodate migrants after they're deported has been sold to locals. Labour are set to announce a new crackdown on tax avoiders today in a bid to help fund the NHS. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will pledge to raise over £5 billion per year, which Labour would use to tackle NHS waiting lists and fund free school breakfast clubs. The party has said it will also raise £2.6 billion over the next parliament by closing loopholes in the government's plans to abolish exemptions for non-DOMs. Shadow Financial Secretary James Murray says it's wrong that some people are getting away without paying what they owe. We're setting up our plans today to crack down on that tax avoidance and to get that money um, into the public purse because, you know, when people right across Britain are paying more and more tax, uh, we think it's wrong that a minority are getting away without paying uh, what they owe. We've been setting out for a number of years about ending a non-DOM tax status. The government said they wanted to follow our lead after years of saying they wouldn't, uh, but they're leaving open loopholes in that, which means that people can avoid paying hundreds of millions of pounds of tax. So we want to close those loopholes. But that's part of a broader approach to investment in HMRC. More than 200 people have been evacuated in West Sussex after the River Arum burst its banks. South East Ambulance Service helped evacuate and rescue around 180 people from a holiday park. One person was taken to hospital with signs of hypothermia. West Sussex County Council said water levels have not yet receded, warning that flooding may increase throughout the day. It said those who have been evacuated remain displaced. The floods are also affecting roads and rail services across the south and into Wales. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Tom and Emily. Right, it's 2.07. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Welcome back. Now, our top story this hour, security is to be raised. At Champions League games this evening, after a media outlet supporting the Islamic State group published threats against the venues. Both Arsenal and Manchester City are in action tonight. Well, let's speak with GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White. Mark, how concerned should we be about this message, this, this call to action? 
Well, I think uh, any time that a terror group like Islamic State posts something like this, it always has to be treated seriously. They have the potential for, if not carrying out direct attacks, certainly inspiring others who might wish to do that. Remember, it was just last month that Islamic State claimed responsibility for that horrific terror attack in Moscow at that theatre and that shopping centre that claimed around 140 lives. So, of course, over the next couple of days, there are some very high-profile football games in uh, these um, quarter-final matches in the Champions League. That game in London between Arsenal and Bayern Munich, and, of course, uh, at the same time, across in the Spanish capital, uh, Manchester City fans are gathering for that clash with Real Madrid. And again, tomorrow uh, in the Spanish capital, Atletico Madrid will take on Borussia Dortmund and then uh, Paris Saint-Germain also playing uh, across in France as well. So, really, uh, some real concern about the potential uh, for terrorist activity. There always is at these big events. Crowded places are a particular risk. Now, that doesn't mean that anything will happen but out of an abundance of caution, uh, you've got the French interior minister, uh, Gérald Darmanin, saying that security will be enhanced for the game tomorrow night in Paris. You've got his Spanish counterpart saying that the games in Madrid will also see additional security. Now, we've spoken to Scotland Yard about the situation in the UK. Nothing official really coming from them. They will always police these events accordingly. They will have significant numbers of officers that are both visible, uh, but they will have a security infrastructure that's not visible, uh, that is also keeping an eye on individuals who potentially could pose a threat. A reminder, certainly, that the Islamist terror threat hasn't gone away. Well, as far as Islamic State is concerned, you'll remember, of course, uh, from about 2014 onwards, they were a very significant threat, carrying out and inspiring lots of attacks, uh, particularly across Europe. We saw these attacks uh, in France and in Belgium, in Germany, here in the UK, multiple attacks that took place, especially in in 2017. But then we had that uh, coalition effort to dismantle Islamic State, and that was to an extent successful in certainly degrading Islamic State's capability to launch direct attacks. But what ne what's never gone away as far as Islamic State, IS, uh, however you want to describe them, ISIL, another name they're known as, uh, what's never gone away is the capacity to radicalise others, uh, particularly using the likes of the internet. And that was a big concern for the authorities during lockdown, that many people would be at home, would be uh, on the internet, would be susceptible to the type of propaganda messages uh, coming from the likes of uh, ISIL and other terror groups. And then, of course, add to that the situation that's unfolding in the Middle East at the moment, in Gaza. Uh, that is another potential agent uh, for stirring up uh, these extremist groups. Um, so, you know, there is, without a doubt, uh, heightened concern generally across Europe and uh, in the West uh, more broadly. But in addition to that, we've got to mention the fact that here in the UK, the terror threat level was reduced a while back to substantial, and it's never gone back up. It was at severe for quite a number of years uh, during all of these terror attacks in 2017. Uh, but it's gone down to substantial. That still means an attack is likely, but not at severe, which means an attack is highly likely. So I think we should take our lead as well from where we are in terms of the national terror threat as to how the authorities here in the UK view these threats coming out uh, from ISIS. Yes, it might well be that the real threat from this sort of call to action here 
is from people who aren't on the radar mm. of the security services, who are sort of lone wolves inspired by what they read online rather than anything more sophisticated and organised. Uh, Mark White, thank you so much for bringing us the very latest there. Hugely concerning story. Shall we get the security angle now from security spe specialist Will Geddes, who joins us now uh, to discuss this further? Uh, Will, what sort of precautions might these stadiums now be taking? Well, to be honest, Tom, and good afternoon, Emily and Tom. Uh, thank you for inviting me on today. They are very well rehearsed in this country. Um, most of the stadiums, and I do work with a couple of the Premier League clubs, uh, are in a very, very good position in terms of their counterterrorism initiatives and also their strategies. So they will have pretty advanced technology, certainly in terms of facial recognition, uh, but also in terms of the re response mechanisms that they've got in being able to coordinate with the police, which they often do so. And therefore, you know, if we were going to be in any good shape, now is a time where we really are in good shape to potentially prevent or repel an attack of this type. And we're just showing on the screen a blurred out image of the threatening message that was posted. You've got the Emirates Stadium, the Parc de Prince, the Metropolitano Arena, the Santiago Berner something, uh, Bernabeu, um, there. So this is very clear, four different stadiums potentially under threat. How does a group like this organise? This seems to be quite a basic call out to try and encourage uh, would-be terrorists to take action. Well, you're absolutely right, Emily. I mean, it's what uh, pretty much what Mark was saying. You know, there, it's, a, it's a call to arms, uh, particularly through their media, recognised media channel, Al Azim. Uh, this is a foundation which has been used as a media conduit to publicise the messages for Islamic State. We're in a very, very precarious time right now. We have a number of terrorist groups, Hamas, we have Hezbollah, and we have Islamic State, as well as Al-Qaeda, and let's not forget, they are still very active, who are competing with each other almost for attention. And Islamic State, obviously, with their attack on the Crocus Theatre in Moscow, was a significant attack. As Mark mentioned, 147 people killed, 200 people injured. So they're looking to put themselves very much back on the map to say that we are a group to be reckoned with. Now, equally, as you've already discussed, one of the biggest concerns is the individual. I like to call them lone actors rather than lone wolves. It tends to romanticize it a little too much. But these are disenchanted, uh, disfranchised individuals who are seeking to put their name on the map. Well, you have a, a lot of people out there who are feeling very alienated, very isolated. And for those that are suffering, in some capacity or another, see this as their outlet, potentially, to associate themselves to a greater cause, as they may believe, however perverse that might be. Now, just quickly, what is the risk here that we're all being taken for fools, that they're publicising the uh, uh, threats to these stadia so that there will be se increased security there? Could the strike actually come somewhere else while we're all looking the other way? Yeah, very, very much, very much so, Tom. I mean, again, you know, the security services, I know in Spain, in Madrid, because they've got two games they're hosting in the next 48 hours. Uh, we have one here at the Emirates Stadium, and there's another one, obviously, uh, that I believe is in Germany. I'm not sure. But um, not being a football fan. However, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. And we saw this with the Stade de France and the Bataclan attack. And you could look at simultaneous or collateral attacks being taken uh, taken out on other targets. So the security services, uh, the various uh, anti-terrorism agencies in, in, in Spain, for example, they've seconded 3,000 uh, security personnel to their particular events in Madrid. So, you know, they're not taking any chances on this. And those individuals are not going to be assigned purely to the stadiums. They'll be looking at the train stations. They'll be looking at other notable landmarks. Because, again, remember, when it comes to terrorism, they are very, very media savvy. They're looking for identifiable targets, which are very easily translate when they are published or they're, they're uh, released, certainly into the news. Well, thank you very much indeed, Will Geddes. You are a security specialist. Always great to get your perspective on this. It's a very good point you made about whether they want all the attention to be on these stadia and then actually for something to take place elsewhere. I mean, hopefully that is not the case and there is absolutely no threat. This is, of course, an alleged threat as it stands, but very worrying nonetheless. Yeah, and it does, just does 
highlight the fact that so often, now that our security specialists do sort of break into the sophisticated networks, mm. as, as Will was saying, we actually have done a fairly good job in this country of breaking down the, the sort of bomb threats that used to be perhaps more prevalent. But the man who murdered David Amos was acting as a complete lone wolf. He was uh, not linked to anything else. He was radicalised himself online and just went out with a knife. Could it be that that is precisely what is the biggest risk now? Because it's so hard for our security services to track down someone mm. like that. Also, I wonder, this image has been picked up, this message has been picked up by Western media, but I do wonder whether there are frequently images like this shared mm. across uh, potential terror groups and the like. Um, it could be that this one has been picked up on and it looks like the security services are very much responding. Um, let us know what you make of it. GBnews.com forward slash your say. We will, as ever, get to some of your views shortly coming up in the show. But uh, we're going to be speaking about council fat cat pay because it is surging to new record levels, believe it or not. Lots and lots of council workers now on more than £150,000, some on more than the Prime Minister himself. We'll have more on that after the break. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. It's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way and we already know that anyway. But it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore. And that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not that good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So, in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 21 minutes past two. Now, later this hour, we are going to have more detail on this new and emerging potential threat from ISIS, a group that we thought had not posed threats to the United Kingdom for quite some time. Uh, but uh, more on that later. 
Now, council fat cat pay surges to new levels, with the record rise in the amount that staff are pocketing. Yes, more than £150,000 a year, almost 200 people now on that across our local councils. That's according to new research carried out by the Taxpayers' Alliance. Yes, this comes, of course, as dozens of English councils face bankruptcy and millions of households are being hit by soaring council tax bills. Uh, shall we speak to Reem Ibrahim from the Institute of Economic Affairs? She is the communications officer there. Uh, Reem, lots of people will be wondering why on earth are council workers earning potentially more than the Prime Minister? Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely awful, and this is a really interesting report by the Taxpayers' Alliance, effectively showing that there are huge numbers of people that basically run these uh, particular sections within councils that are being paid obscene amounts of money. Now, we might beg to question, you know, we want the best talent in our local councils, we want the best types of people in our councils. The fact that somebody received remuneration of over £651,000 in a single year, I think tells us exactly how much of that is going to those particular individuals. Now, this all again comes as, you know, inflation busting tax hikes are hitting up in millions and millions of people across the country. And, you know, as a result of that, we're not seeing better public services. I think we have to also remember the private sector, hardworking people make that money and councils take it and spend it. But where is that money going? Are we seeing our potholes being filled? Are we seeing our, our, our local services improving? Libraries across the country are being cut. Meanwhile, we're spending huge amounts of money through our council taxes and actually all of that money, a lot of that money, sorry, is going towards these fat cat council bosses. And yet, Reem, perhaps is this uh, another story about how little we pay our Prime Minister? I mean, oh, this is the okay. guy who's in charge of the country. He's on about a quarter of what the US president is on. He's on less than the German Chancellor, the French president. Why do we comparatively, given it's the most important job in the country, pay our PM so little? Yeah, not just the Prime Minister, I mean, also members of Parliament. You know, we want the best pe best types of people in Parliament. We want the best people uh, working for, for our public services and working for the public, and yet we pay them so little comparatively uh, to the private sector. It does also beg the question as to why uh, we want to spend so much money on local services, on things that are particularly inefficient. And when you've got so many layers of government, so much bureaucracy, that you get these kind of things happening. And actually, it's really important work the Taxpayers' Alliance are doing in order to uncover that so we actually know where our money is going and we can hold them accountable and i think look i think many residents across the country are going to be looking at where our money is going where our taxes are being spent and how much of that is going to improving public services i think it also begs the question about whether or not more money is the answer to many of these services and actually if a lot of that is going to council bosses that are earning huge amounts of money we saw even with bonuses of up to seventy thousand pounds you know, is is that is are we really getting the bang for our buck? Yes, for me it's whether there's waste and whether we can make these councils more efficient with our money. Thank you very much indeed, Reem Ibrahim, communications Thank officer you. at the Institute of Economics Affairs. Um, reflecting on mm. quite shocking how many people are earning so much money at our councils, considering all the bankrupt councils out there, mm. all the waste, all the inefficiencies, but perhaps that's the market rate. Now, I mentioned how much the Prime Minister earned in comparison to the United States President. Shall we cross state sides now? Because the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, is on the charm offensive down in Florida, hoping to secure American money for Ukraine. Yes, the former Prime Minister travelled to meet Donald Trump in Florida. He's hoping to persuade the presidential candidate to back a $60 billion aid package for Ukraine. He'll now meet with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken to discuss securing that support. Well, joining us now is the former White House advisor to President Trump, Sebastian Gorka. And Sebastian, it's an interesting pitch that David Cameron is making to your former boss, saying that borders matter and sometimes Money must be spent to protect the integrity of borders. Now, that's true on the southern border of the United States, but it's also true on that border between Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, this is quite... Um, I don't uh, envy David because of, you know, the inconsistency of the Biden administration. Biden reversed everything we did in the Trump White House and has let in at least 8 million illegals that we know of in the last three years. So I guess the integrity physically and the national sovereignty of America don't matter, but Ukraine is super important. 
But he'll have a good meeting with my former boss, President Trump, who wants the war to end in Ukraine as soon as possible. Uh, and I think it's a realization that everybody knows who's living in the real world, who's going to be the president after the next election here in America. And how do you imagine the two men talk to each other? Uh, David Cameron did dismiss the president a little in the past. He called him xenophobic. He called him misogynistic. Would that bother Donald Trump? Oh, no, I, I mean, it, absolutely not, because he understands... Sorry, we just have a little bit of a he, delay he on the line. He understands how persist. people are... Um... Can you hear me, guys? We can indeed. We've just got a slight delay on the line to you, but I think we're going to power on through. Yeah, so look, he understands that... Um... <clears throat> Others are uh, a little bit beholden to woke forces. They have to repeat the talking points of the Twitterati. Uh, he won't hold a grudge against uh, David, and uh, he'll they'll talk behind closed doors. What needs to be said will will be said. And don't forget, the president has a very very warm place in his heart for the UK, and that's the most important thing. We need him back in the Oval Office, and then we can have proper relations between 10 Downing Street and the White House. I suppose one of the big questions will be what will be the makeup of Downing Street over here? It could be that Lord Cameron is not Foreign Secretary by the time that Donald Trump gets into the White House, if indeed he does win election uh, in November. Look, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I, I grew up in the UK under the great Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> the absolute shambles, the shower that is today's Tory party is, is an embarrassment to everyone who remembers those years and who loves America. It's also an embarrassment to everyone who voted for Brexit. The idea that the Conservative Party today couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery is embarrassing. So. Yeah, ho hopefully Nigel will come back, save the Conservative Party, and then we can have some real, real Tories back at 10 Downing Street. And Sebastian, we, uh, we understand that they will also be discussing uh, the issues in Gaza, the ongoing war in Gaza. Um, does Donald Trump's position differ substantially from that of President Joe Biden? Oh, my gosh, massively. The, the Democrat Party, Biden's Democrat Party, has become a hive of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. And look at the fact they've got members of Congress like Ilhan Oman and Rashida Tlaib who talk about the, the Jewish influence in America, how they've hypnotized the West, and it's all about dollar signs. I mean, really reprehensible anti-Semitism in the Democrat Party, as opposed to President Trump the president who moved our embassy to Jerusalem, who recognized it as the capital of the eternal state of, of, course, of Israel. Of course, there is no more philo-Semitic president Joe Biden than President Trump. Lot. Palestinian activists from the left do seem to not like the policy of Joe Biden. He's been repeatedly interrupted at speech after speech by pro-Palestinian hecklers. Yeah, because he has those radicals inside his own party. That's not, you know, red MAGA hat wearing Trump voters who are screaming at Biden. You know, he's caught between a rock and a hard place because he hates Bibi. I mean, the Democrat leader of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, said the Israelis need to get rid of their duly elected prime minister. That's how much of a Jew hatred has become the pole of this party, and Biden's trying to walk the tightrope in the middle, and he's failing. Well, very interesting to get your view on all of this, as always, Sebastian Gorka. Sorry your line was a little bit delayed there, but we got, we got to the discussion, former advisor to President Trump Cheers. himself. Well, do you think that David Cameron holds any sway, influence, when it comes to Donald Trump? Or is it a nicety that they met? I think it's really interesting. I think he's got to be able to say, because the real important meeting, of course, is not with President Trump. It's with people on the Hill. It's yep, with thinking. the Congress, uh, the congressmen and women uh, in the House of Representatives, because Biden has said that this package, he, he, would, uh, he would not veto it, he would sign it into law. Um, the Senate have backed the package. It's just the House of Representatives that haven't. And, of course, it's those swing 20 or so Republican congressmen that matter. So for... for Cameron to be able to say, look, I've spoken to Trump, 
And he agrees with me. <laughs> well, maybe. Or maybe he'll find more diplomatic words to say. <sighs> but I think that's an important tool in his armoury for the actual important meeting, which is with those congressional leaders. Yes, indeed. He does have quite a few people to persuade, does he not, if this uh, $60 billion package is going to get across the line. Um, but don't go anywhere, because very shortly we're going to be discussing Labour's plans to help fund commitments to schools and the NHS by clamping down on tax avoidance. We're also going to bring you the very latest from this very new ISIS threat towards the Champions League and their stadia. So don't go anywhere. Let's get your news headlines. It's 2.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. Police say they have arrested a suspect in a murder investigation after a mother was stabbed to death while pushing her baby in a pram. 27-year-old Kolsuma Aktka died after being stabbed on Westgate in Bradford. Police then launched a manhunt to search for a suspect. A 25-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, the Met Police has referred itself to the independent police watchdog after a woman was stabbed to death in central London. The victim was discovered dead, having suffered multiple stab wounds in her home near Hyde Park. Scotland Yard said officers were contacted on Sunday by friends of the woman who were concerned about her welfare. It was not until the next day that police forced entry to the woman's home. The Met Police say they are working 24-7 to identify and arrest whoever may be responsible for the attack. Six migrants have been injured in the latest wave of violence in northern France as people smugglers clashed with asylum seekers trying to force their way onto small boats without paying. The latest violence erupted on a beach near Dunkirk and resulted in at least two migrants being stabbed multiple times. The incident was followed by more violence in the same area just a short time later when police came under attack from a large group of migrants who threw stones, bottles and other missiles at the officers. And the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has met the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in Downing Street. They reflected on the 30-year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide and discussed the plan to send migrants to the African country. The visit comes as it was revealed that some of the housing built to accommodate migrants after they are deported has been sold to locals. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's feeling much cooler out there today than yesterday. There are rain and wind warnings in force, but it will turn somewhat drier this evening. That's just this area of low pressure, which will bring some persistent rain to some through the rest of the day, gets replaced by this ridge of higher pressure through, through this evening and overnight. But before then, some very persistent rain to come for many areas of northern England, much of Scotland as well. There is a rain warning in force for southern areas of Scotland, so there could be some disruption from the rainfall. The winds are also going to be very strong everywhere across the UK, but in particular across the west coast of Wales, northwest England as well. So it's going to be feeling particularly chilly exposed to that wind. But across parts of Northern Ireland, Wales and into southern England, it should be drier with a chance of some sunny spells through the rest of the afternoon. Overnight tonight, the low pressure pushes away and it turns dry and clear for the bulk of the UK overnight. But that will allow temperatures to fall away. So it's going to be a chillier night than of late with a touch of frost expected for parts of Scotland as well as northern England. However, from the west, we'll start to see cloud thicken through Wednesday morning. So Northern Ireland will likely see a bit of a wetter start. That rain will spread into South Wales, the southwest through the first hours of the morning and then elsewhere across the country later on. So after a brighter start, you'll likely see some rain and cloudier skies later on in the day. The rain will put turn quite persistent across western areas of Scotland as well. And here there's a rain warning in force, but it does introduce much milder air. So it will be a warmer day. The latest GB News travel. Good afternoon, I'm John Vincent. Queues on the M62 westbound in West Yorkshire. There's a lane close to an accident between Junction 23 Huddersfield and 22 Rishworth Moor. Queue in traffic on the M66 southbound in Manchester. There's a lane close there for an accident between Junction 2 Berry and 3 for Hollins. And there's been an accident on the M4 Prince of Wales Bridge westbound. As a result, we're seeing queues there. Also a slowdown eastbound as well. Nearby M48 Seven Bridge has a lane close in each direction for strong winds and matrix signs set to 
of 40 miles an hour. And we're seeing queuing traffic in Bedfordshire on the M1 through the roadworks southbound just before Junction 11, Dunstable South. And in Cheshire, the A55 westbound is still closed at the Vickers Cross interchange due to a police incident. So we're seeing queues on surrounding routes. That's the latest traffic and travel. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 38 minutes past two. Now, our top story this hour has been, of course, that security is being raised at Champions League games this evening. After a media outlet supporting Islamic State, that group of terrorists, published threats against venues. Yes, you can see on your screen there four different stadiums. Are there potential threat against them. Both Arsenal and Manchester City are in action tonight. Uh, this is the poster that has been published. We've blurred out some of the wording there um, for uh, reasons of propriety. Mm. Um, but there you go. You get the gist from that image, a rather threatening terror threat. And, of course, could that mean that Emirates Stadium in the heart of London is under uh, a serious degree of threat. There will be heightened security there, but you've been getting in touch with your views on this latest development. Andrew says, terrorist threat, when you have borders like a sieve and allow extremists to come in, they radicalise others, what do we expect? We have weak government, police force and a pathetic border force. Yes, Stephen says, in light of the news from Islamic fundamentalists and con considering this current government have been pretty much incompetent, whilst I trust wholeheartedly in our armed forces and intelligence experts, what believable assurances can the Ministry of Defence give the British public that they've got this under control? Um, so there you go. Now, we're hearing that the Met are very much aware of this apparent threat. We've got security heightened in Madrid and in other areas. The stadium will be on high alert. Um, but the media channel that's responsible for spreading these messages is the Al Azaim Foundation. And Gary raises a point about uh, whether we've got security going in the right places. If there is this heightened threat uh, tonight, uh, Gary says they know the stadium will be no go, so we'll probably go for London Transport. Please remember, half brain evil terrorists copy films to plot their evil way and hopefully don't succeed. Well, we do know that there will be heightened alert this evening and we'll be following uh, these developments very closely indeed. I think many people will feel that an ISIS threat was something of the past, was something of the last decade, but uh, it does seem that there is increased at least activity in terms of threats. We don't know yet whether they'll materialise into action. Yes, and UEFA have said they're aware of the threats. They've said, as so far, games will go ahead as planned, but with appropriate security arrangements in place. So what that will look like in reality, I guess, huge amounts of police presence, mm. security services, terror police too. But as you say, there'll be a, a, a high alert elsewhere Yes, as well. And right across the continent. Um, but in other news, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is unveiling plans to fund commitments to schools and the NHS by, get this, clamping down on tax avoidance. Where have we heard that before? Just about every single manifesto in the last 30 years. Now, the Labour Party says their tax crackdown will raise £5 billion by the end of the next Parliament, but it all comes amid a scandal over one of their senior members of the Shadow Cabinet, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, being accused of not paying her own tax herself. Yes, and as we were reporting earlier too, uh, the majority of the public, according to recent polling, think that she should actually just publish her tax advice, publish what was going on and be a little more transparent about it. But we're now joined by GB News Economics and Business Editor Liam Halligan with On The Money. Liam, is there anything different about this Labour crackdown on tax avoidance than previous tax avoidance uh, clampdowns that we've seen? 
No, I don't think it is. It's a perennial of the sort of political cycle that when parties start limbering up for general elections, they want to make pledges of the money that they can spend and put in their shop window goodies in front of the voting public. But they don't want to commit to tax rises, of course, so they say, I know, we'll get more money from the people who should be paying more tax, from tax evasion, which, of course, is illegal, and tax avoidance, which is the legal uh, use of tax law to navigate, if you like, to pay as little as is legally possible. Evasion and avoidance are very different. I think what is uh, slightly more eye-catching by the Shadow Chancellor this morning, Rachel Reeves, is that she's linking the money that she wants to spend to a report by the National Audit Office. The National Audit Office, if you like, is like the government's own accountant, internal accountant, internal auditor. Uh, they look at how government money is spent and how it should be spent a bit better. But let's give Rachel Reeves her due. These are the numbers that she put out this morning, talking about how she's going to clamp down on tax avoidance. Labour's tax plans, they want to raise an extra £2.6 billion uh, a year by the end of the next Parliament. Uh, by 2029-30, clamping down on non-DOM loopholes. We've talked about this many times. Labour had a policy that they wanted to make it more difficult for wealthy foreigners to declare themselves tax resident abroad, even though they actually live in the UK. Uh, the Tories came up with a policy very similar to Labour's, and now Labour have tightened that policy some more. They claim that's going to raise two and a half billion quid a year in five years' time. Then another £2.4 billion Labour say they can raise from clamping down on other forms of tax evasion. They point to the National Audit Office. They have an estimate of something called the tax gap, which is how much tax should be paid if everyone complied with the law and how much tax actually is paid. That tax gap is something like £30 billion. Labour are claiming that to get £5 billion in total from that is money on the table. They want to spend this quotes, extra money, which may or may not materialise, of course, on NHS appointments, more dental appointments, trying to tackle those waiting lists, which are now at record levels. An estimated 9 million people in the UK are waiting on an NHS waiting list and, indeed, on breakfast clubs, where primary schools provide breakfast for kids for free. And Reeves also, she, she is at pains to point out, in every single TV and radio appearance, she says, everything in our manifesto will be fully costed and funded. And she says that because, you know, the government's coffers really are stretched tight now, to mix my metaphors. There isn't much money around. Even the Tories would admit that if a Labour government does come in, their inheritance, if you like, the situation they're inheriting in terms of economic growth, public debt, uh, still quite high inflation, is a much more difficult, challenging inheritance than, say, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown inherited when Labour won a landslide back in 1997. So she's trying to manage expectations. She's trying to say to many voters on the left and the left of her own party, we're not going to be able to just let the spending floodgates open because financial markets will push back and we'll have a sim situation similar to back in the autumn of 2022 when interest rates spiked, mortgage rates spiked, borrowing costs spiked across the economy. So I think you're both right to be slightly um, sceptical that this extra money can materialise from clamping down on tax evasion and avoidance and clamping down on non-DOMs. But, Rachel, Reeves isn't the first shadow chancellor to claim that she can conjure up this money from nowhere, and she certainly won't be the last. No, it does seem that history is repeating itself, not least with sticking to Tory spending limits and, and, and rules. Although back when Blair did that in 1997, we had 4% growth, and uh, last time I checked in the UK in January, we had 0.1% growth. So that might be just a touch harder. And that's right. And when Blair came in, um, I mean, I was a political reporter at, at, at the time. Within a couple of years, the UK government was actually running a surplus from year to year, where taxation revenue was higher than spending. Uh, the so-called Iron Chancellor, Gordon Brown, really mm -hmm. keeping the spending gates firmly shut. Many historians would say, uh, and journalists there at the time, me included, that later in his chancellorship, Brown sort of reverse ferreted and spent probably more money than he, than, than he should have done. But 
there could not really be more difference between Rachel Reeves's economic inheritance if indeed she does become the first female chancellor later this year for a Labour government and the economic inheritance that Ken Clark and the Tories mm. bequeath to Tony Blair yeah. and Gordon Brown. History often doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Liam Halligan, thank you very much for bringing us all of that. No, it's a, it's a, it's a profound point. Yeah. It is indeed. And the problem is, all these things are based on estimates, mm -hmm. aren't they? Oh, we can claw back £5 billion to spend on the NHS. Is there actual evidence and proof that they can find that mm -hmm. just through trying to clamp down on tax dodgers? Well, depends how uh, um, positive you are, I and guess. The question some people might be asking is what is going to be spent on national defence? What is going to be spent on, frankly, bearing down on the terror threat? As, of course, we learned today, threats from Islamic State against football games tonight. We'll have more on that after this. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. TfL bosses have come under fire after banning an advert... Oh, God. <laughs> they banned an advert for a comedy show because it had a hot dog on it, because that supposedly promotes obesity. The comedian Ed Gamble has swapped the image of the fast food favourite in favour of a cucumber instead. And there's the cucumber on the plate. So is the UK turning into a nanny state? Let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families, Steve Miller, and nutritionist Olivia Parry. Good to see you both this morning. Olivia, it's a comedy show. Um, he's not promoting eating hot dogs, is he? Is this just a load of nonsense? The thing is, we have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in this country. We're fourth in Europe. Um, it's big business. Advertising for food companies is big business. They make, you know, they make so much money. You just have to switch on primetime TV to watch, you know, food after food advertisement. And we, it, it's for the youngsters as well who don't have the nutritional education. We're not taught cookery in school anymore. People go to go to college and to university. They don't know how to cook. But and it leads forgive me, to, forgive like, me for jumping in, Olivia. Know. Forgive me for jumping in. But the, but the, the whole point with this is it's an advert for a comedy show. Yes, I know. But this is a this is a wider issue. I think it's a load of old tosh. To be quite honest with you. It's a hot dog. In fact, I wish they'd have put onions on the hot dog. A bit of what you fancy won't hurt you. You should eat 80 20 anyway. You know, we talk about a nanny state. I actually think, arguably, we're becoming an authoritarian state. Opinions banned. Comedy banned. The England flag banned. It's like we've got to wear a virtual muzzle. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Right, well, it's 2.51 and have you ever dreamt of moving to Spain? Given it some thought. Have you? Every now and again, when it's weather? as miserable as so it is outside. It's in 2026. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have, if you, well, exactly, something to wait for if, in northern Spain, anyway. Uh, but if you have, we've got some bad news for you, apparently. The country's government is currently planning to end a scheme which grants residency to foreigners who buy property in the country. Yes, more than 300,000 Brits currently live in sunny Spain. But let's cross over to Marbella now and speak with a state agent. Marbella. 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 <laughs> there we Marbella. go. Let's cross across to Marbella. 
Sorry, that you, really made me do laugh. You, do you call the drink Estrella or Estrella? It's like That's paella, paella. Yeah, isn't it? I say paella. Oh yeah, wow. it's, I think it's. I know. I know you're not supposed to, but. Do you call it Paris or Paris? That's anyway, let's question. introduce estate <laughs> <Right>. agent <laughs> Michael Dolan, who's been waiting, listening to us witter on. <laughs> he sells properties to people moving to Spain from the UK. Well, Michael, are you worried about this? This is a change in policy from the Spanish government, isn't it? Well, I mean, it is a negative blow with an attempt to fight uh, rising uh, house prices and property speculation here in Spain. Um, however, you know, if you look at 2022, maybe 19,000 uh, properties have been sold to foreign purchasers, of which the British work, you know, 11%. But in order to get a golden visa, you need to spend over 500,000 euros. And to be absolutely honest, the British only accounted for 400 of the golden visas applications which were granted in 2022, where other countries such as China, Russia, Ukraine, United States outnumbered the British uh, golden visa applicants. So this is actually something that is only the preserve of, of perhaps people who have quite a lot of money? Exactly. And you have to pay for a property without a mortgage, don't you? So you have to have the cash up yeah. front. Over 500,000 or at least 500,000 euros in order to be invested into a Spanish bank account or into a property. And have you seen an uptick in the number of Brits who want to uh, swap the United Kingdom for uh, the sunnier Spain? Absolutely, of course. The golden visa was something that came into power in 2013, and there's maybe 10,000 golden visas that have been granted since then. But the British have only taken an interest in that since, uh, since uh, Brexit. Mm. Understandable reasons, no longer free movement. But Michael Dolan, thank you so much for joining us, estate agent, of course, from Marbella or Marbella, depending on your. <laughs> so it view. just made me. It just made me laugh with because the gusto you said it with. Yeah, well, I know. I, I pronounced. I, I I pronounced Barnstaple. 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 The other yeah, day. Yeah. This is the problem. Sometimes when you read it's a true. name, but why do you we get say? It why wrong. do we? Why do we say the, the Spanish pronunciation for that, but we don't say Paris? We say Paris. It, it doesn't make any sense, does <laughs> Sorry. it? Marbella. Sorry, Martin, no, you've no got a show coming up. No one has ever said Marbella, I bet someone has. No, Martin, what's on your show? <laughs> Marbella, Eileen, Marbella. Uh, we're not doing that. It's kicking off in the Champions League, though, of course. ISIS are targeting Man City, Arsenal, Paris Saint-Germain and Barcelona. Also, Rachel Reeves meets GB News. And why is it raining so much all the time? Officially not funny. Talking of which, here's your weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be turning a little bit drier through the rest of the day and into this evening with the rain and the wind easing. That's as this area of low pressure that's brought the windy and fairly wet weather pushes off into the North Sea and a ridge of higher pressure will arrive overnight. That's going to turn things drier through this evening across Northern Ireland, many western areas of the UK. Some rain still to come for the next few hours across the east coast of Scotland and Northern England. But then it turns considerably dry, so a clear night for most areas away from the far west and that's going to allow temperatures to dip down so it's going to be a much colder start tomorrow than of late we could see a touch of frost across some rural areas of scotland northeastern england as well and everywhere is going to feel on the chilly side However, wet weather will spread in from the west quite quickly through Wednesday, particularly across Northern Ireland first thing, but then into Wales, southwest England, and then into northwestern areas of Scotland. That's where the rain's going to be the most persistent, as well as across parts of the Lake District as well. So there is a rain warning in force, but this rain is going to be bringing with it much milder air. So it's going to be a warmer day tomorrow, and that warm feel will continue through the rest of the week. And it will turn a little bit drier for many areas. There will be a band of cloud and rain across the south coast from time to time through Thursday. But it does look like it will turn that much drier, with temperatures climbing to the high teens, possibly the low 20s by Friday. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening.